For the first time ever, I'm publishing one of our live trainings that is gonna give you a ton of value if you're trying to get into real estate investing. It was a three-day event where I went over how to find, fund, and flip your first deal. Day one was all about why you should invest in real estate and all the different methods you can use to go find your first deal. Day two, we went over how you could fund deals without using any of your own money right now. And in day three, we went over how to flip the deal. What is the best exit strategy so you can make the most amount of money? It was a super impactful three-day event. We had so many people ready to start getting that first deal. And now you can watch all three days right here for free. Let's talk about what we're going to be going over today with this Flip Your Future Challenge. Um, day one, okay, is going to be all, well, let me just break it down actually on the big picture of it. So we have a three-day event, okay? Day one, we're going over find, how to find real estate deals, how to get started, because everything starts with the deal. If you can find the deal, everything else becomes easy, okay? Number two is fund. We're gonna go over how you can get funding for a deal, all right? How you can go raise money, how you can do deals without using any of your own money, how you can make money even if you're broke today, okay? Day three, we're going over flip, how you go about actually flipping the property. Now, there's a lot of different exit strategies you've probably heard about, whether it's you know wholesaling, flipping, rentals, Airbnb, creative finance. I'm sure you guys have heard of all the different strategies. And so on day three, we're going to cover those different strategies and how to figure out how to flip the deal and make money. Now, here's the, th the cool thing, guys. I truly believe that no matter where you're at today, you can make a bunch of money in real estate investing. And I'm going to show you that in the next three days. But I got one thing I need to ask of you, okay? Here's my only ask. I'm doing this all completely for free, okay? We, you know, charge a lot of money for our different programs or different events. And, you know, you'll hear about that throughout the challenge as time goes on. But I want to just give you so much value this whole three days that I'm going to spend two hours on this stage. So what I want you to do is make sure you're blocked out from 9 to 11 Pacific time um, to attend this challenge. Because I'm going to spend the first probably half going over all of the content and all of the things you need to know. And then I'm going to spend the second half doing Q&A, questions directly from YouTube, directly from Facebook, and we're gonna go over, I'm gonna answer them, you know, and go more in depth on how to do this, okay? So I just know, I just um, am asking you guys, make sure you stay for the full three days, make sure that you're here for the full two hours, and you're gonna not, um, you're not gonna regret it. It can change your life no matter where you're at today. So all that being said, um, we are also going to have prizes, and we're going to have giveaways and we're going to have um, just homework that I want you guys to do after each day. Because guess what? If you're trying to make a change in your life, it doesn't come from just listening to information. It comes from listening and doing. Now, I don't expect you to go get a deal right this moment, but you can just start taking micro steps to get that very first win. And for you, that first win is going to be with this homework after day one. So in the comments, put a one if you can follow those directions. If you're committed to doing that the next three days, put a one in the chat box because I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I don't want to sit up here and waste my time for two hours a day the next three days. Like I've got other things I could be doing that are going to be great, but I'm going to do this with anticipation that you guys are going to hold up your end of the bargain and make sure you commit to doing this for the next three days. So I see a lot of ones in the chat. Appreciate you guys for committing. We're going to have a really fun time doing all of this. So uh, let's make it happen. All right. So day one, we're going over find, then we're going over fund in day two, and we're going over flip in day three. So today, when it comes to finding deals, all right, there's a lot of ways to go about it. And I'm going to go over those here um, in a few minutes. But I want to just talk about the overall philosophy of real estate and what we believe at Wealthy Investor. So Javi, my COO, who actually started as a student in Wealthy Investor, um, kind of touched on it a little bit. Let me pull this over so that you guys can see the screen. Okay, that looks pretty good. All right, we have a philosophy here at Wealthy Inve Investor called make, okay, manage, multiply, okay? All right, now I'm gonna briefly go over this so you guys understand what it means, okay? Stage one of every entrepreneur in real estate, and doesn't even have to be um, real estate, but this is for any business that we teach, is make. Now, for us, you have not graduated this stage of make 
until you've made 250K in one thing. All right? You got to make 250K in one thing. At the end of the day, um, so many entrepreneurs struggle with the side hustle culture that we have. And maybe I'm guilty of that because I've done so many videos about Turo and Airbnb and flipping watches and, you know, flipping this, flipping couches. And so, you know, you get all these people who are like, oh, I'm going to flip a house here. I'm going to flip a couch there. I'm going to do this over here. And the reality is none of that's going to make you wealthy. You'll definitely never get to the managed stage, which is where you start creating some real wealth. Um, The only way to become wealthy is to learn a skill that can make you at least 250 grand a year. If you don't have that skill, you are not going to be able to grow to the level you wanna grow at. Um, How many of you guys feel stagnant and you feel like you're just kind of chasing a lot of things all at once? Put a two in the chat box if you feel like that's you. Because most entrepreneurs that I talk to feel this way. They're like, oh, well, this is the new flavor of the week. This feels good to try. Oh, I saw this person having success doing it. Maybe I'm gonna do that, right? That is not the way to become successful. The way to become successful is to focus on one thing and master it. Now, I'm not against trying new things while you figure out the one thing. I'm not against that. But whenever I see people who are like, oh, well, dude, I can't give that up. You know, it it makes me money. And I'm like, how much money does it make you? You're like, oh, well, you know, it makes me a few thousand dollars a year. It makes me $10,000 a year. I'm like, so... This thing that makes you $10,000 a year, is it, does it have the potential to go make you a million dollars? Are you passionate about it? And they'll be like, no. I'm like, well, you should stop doing it and focus on the thing that's actually making you money, right? Because you probably have another job or another career that's making you good money that you can focus on, right? So we want to focus on one thing because at the end of the day, if you know you have one skill that can make you 250 grand, you can be set for life. At 250, you can be living a really good life. You don't even have to make a million dollars, all right? And tomorrow, during the fun day, we're gonna go over how much money you actually need to live a dope life. Because at the end of the day, why are we even getting into real estate? You know, what's the point? The point is we wanna actually make more money to live better lives and provide and do all these other amazing things, okay? So make stage. You gotta make 250K in one thing. Now, here's the beauty of real estate. I love that you can make 250K in lots of different ways. You could wholesale, you could flip, you could do Airbnb. There's lots of paths that get you to 250 and we teach all of them at Wealthy Investor, okay? And we had lots of students who have done multiple paths and gotten there, different ones, okay? So there's not just one thing that, you know, you need to worry about with um, how you're gonna do it, but once you pick that one thing, that's what you're going all in on, okay? So once you've figured out how to make 250K in one thing, the next step is to go to the manage side, okay? This is when you're gonna grow your biz to 1 million, right? Now, to get to the manage stage, it's very different than the make stage because at 250K, all of you can go make that by yourself. I mean, we all have the ability to make 250K by ourselves as solopreneurs. I did it, I know many others who have as well. Think about it, on the house flipping side, if you flipped five houses that made 50 grand each, right? That's getting a deal like every other month, you're at 250K. You could flip five houses by yourself. I promise you, it does not take a lot of time. You could flip 10 houses by yourself. In fact, my second year in real estate investing, I flipped 20 homes by myself. I had no help. I found the deals. I managed the deals, did everything on my own. I even listed them. I was a realtor at the time, okay? And I'll I'll jump a little more into my story, but at the end of the day, um, you can do this by yourself. But stage two in the managed stage is when you get to building a business around that skill. So for me, once I got into year three and year four, I knew I had to go start building a team to get past a million bucks. And I had to go get sales guys. I had to hire project managers. I had to get listing agents. You know, I had to get admins and all these different things. And guess what? This stage of manage is a totally different skill set than the stage one, okay? Stage one, I'm just learning the skill. I'm learning how to make money and just do that skill really well. Stage two, I'm learning to actually be a business owner, okay? Now I gotta learn how to be a leader to other people. Now I gotta learn how to hire people. Now I gotta learn how to pay people. Now I gotta learn how to manage people, right? This is what it takes to get to the next level, okay? So manage is a totally different skill set from make. You're trying to learn how to become a business owner, right? So if this is like basically saying, hey, I'm gonna learn how to be 
uh, let's just call it a worker, right? You're, you're learning the skill. Whoops, Vibe has stopped working. All right, cool. This board's broke. Anyways, we'll wait for it to start back up. Technology, I see why like all these other guys use the, uh, the paper and they do it old school because you don't run into these problems. So anyways, while this reboots, what I want to say is on the make stage, up oh, here we go, okay? On the make stage, oh, now my thing is like a crazy Sharpie, okay? On the make stage, you're more like a worker. You're just learning that skill. You're trading time for money. On the manage stage, you're learning to be an owner, right? Now I'm going from doing the stuff myself, trading time for dollars, and now I'm going into the owner stage, learning to manage a business. In the multiply stage, now you're becoming the investor, okay? The multiply stage happens after you make 1 million plus. Now, here's the thing. Once you make over a million bucks in whatever this one business was, you now have the authority and the basically the credibility and you've earned the right to now start thinking about other things. You've earned the right to have another business. You've earned the right to start investing into your business even more and multiplying it. You've earned the right to start buying rental properties and to start buying all these other things, okay? I know so many of you want to own multiple businesses. Let me know in the comments. Put a three in the comments if you want to have multiple businesses, multiple streams of income. Like, I know it's a big goal for you guys because I just hear it every day. But the reality is you have to earn it, okay? No successful entrepreneur just started three, four businesses at once and they didn't know what they were doing. They never made a million dollars. They never even made 250. Yet most of people on social media think they can do it. They think that, oh, I'm gonna go start three businesses at once and do three different things and all of a sudden I'm gonna be successful. It's like no one ever did that. Okay. So you got to build a successful business first. Once you build a successful business, then you can start figuring out how to do more successful businesses because you've earned the right. You actually have had success in business to do this. All right. So that is our framework that we teach at Wealthy Investor, um, you know, for the various stages of your business career and your real estate investing career. Um, so I want to make sure you guys all understand that. Um, that, that's the framework we're going off of. So for most of you, okay, we are trying to get you to the next stage, wherever you're at. So put a, this is what I want to know, just so I know where the audience is, okay? Put a one in the chat if you're still in stage one. Put a two in the chat if you're in stage two. And put a three in the chat if you're in stage three. Just so I know where everyone is at, okay? And this is going to give me a better idea of how I train you guys the next three days because I'm going to get a great idea of, what the audience is doing. Okay. So I'm just seeing a lot of ones. All right. So basically we got a ton of ones. Some of you guys are in stage two. That's amazing. All right. Perfect. That makes it easy for me to address and help you guys through what's going to help. All right. Now let's talk about this. All right. Real estate. First thing we got to discuss before we ever get into deals is why even do we want to get into real estate, right? Like what's the point? Uh, there's lots of other opportunities out there. Um, why real estate? Well, I'll tell you this, okay? Number one, as far as an investing strategy, real estate is like the safest investment ever, right? Stocks, who knows what's gonna happen to them. If it goes to zero, it goes to zero. Um, you know, starting a normal business is really hard. You know, at the end of the day, um, you're competing against markets and technology, AI, like all this stuff. Starting like a normal business can be pretty difficult, right? But with real estate, it's been around since the beginning of time, all right? Real estate has been here forever. It ain't going anywhere. People are always going to fight over land. People are always going to need a place to live. So we can be safe knowing that this industry is going to be around for the long haul. And so to go back to make, manage, multiply, wouldn't it be great to pick an industry that you don't have to worry about <laughs> AI taking it over or whatever? So for us, we can go knowing that real estate's a great choice um, to get started. Um, also, too, you know, there's the saying that 90% of people have, uh, you know, become millionaires in real estate. I, I always bring this up at events. I don't know how true it is, but at the end of the day, uh, that's what the people say. And so I'm going to roll with it. So, you know, real estate's a great thing. Um, you know, in fact, we have, we had nine or we had 30 plus people in our coaching program 
that made over a million dollars. And we honored him at our last event. I don't know if we could pull the graphic up right now. But, uh, you know, we had over 30 of our students join the seven-figure club, meaning they were now in this stage three of Multiply. And those students are amazing because guess what? I mean, they're now trying to get into multi seven figures for their business. They're now buying rental properties. They're now starting other businesses. You know, um, it, it's a really amazing thing. So, you know, we had like, like my goal at the end of the day is to have, oh, look, so they got it right here. Actually, let me pull this out of the way so you guys can see. You know, we got a picture right here of, you know, all of the students we recognized earlier this year that made over a million bucks. And my goal is to have this stage twice the size um, come January of 2024. All right. So that that's my big goal. And I'm super proud of all these guys and, and gals. And uh, it, it's an amazing thing to see. So, you know, real estate is what I believe you should be doing. Um, if you guys can get my screen back here, that'd be great. So, you know, I, I think that all of you guys can do real estate. I think all of you guys can become successful. And I think all of you guys can end up on that stage one day. If you want to end up on that stage one day, you know, it's going to start with getting really good at one skill in real estate. All right. So let me just tell you a little bit um, about my story. And then we're going to jump into how to find real estate deals because that's where this all begins. So many of you um, have the false belief that, oh man, you know, I don't have enough money to get started in real estate, so I'm not going to do it. And the reality is you have enough money. You just need to figure out how you're going to go about um, finding a deal because if you find a deal, the money will find you. Okay. So real quick, um, they've got a graphic up of me right now. Um, if you guys can see that on the left is the very start of my origin as an adult, really, um, as a working adult. I was 21 years old in, in that picture of me with a faux hawk and a tie. And then I was 21 years old in that picture of me um, at, with the Oakland A's. So, you know, I got out of college. I got drafted in 2010. Um, I also became a realtor that year. So I've been in real estate for now, I guess, 13 years, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, but, you know, I got started doing both of those because guess what? Even though I was playing professional baseball, I wasn't making a lot of money. You know, at the time, minor league baseball players were getting paid um, $1,200 a month uh, to you know, go play baseball. And that was only for six months out of the year. All right. So, you know, I'm getting paid basically pennies and it's actually way less than minimum wage. One time we did the math, it came out to making about $3 an hour. That was what we were getting paid to do it. Okay. But nonetheless, um, I knew I was going to have to make money some way. So I became a realtor. This was back in 2010. Well, you know, I'm becoming a realtor and I'm realizing like, I hate this. Okay. Back in 2010, I don't know if you guys were there, but, uh, you know, I was just like <laughs> trying to figure my life out and prices were at all time lows. Uh, you know, houses that were selling for $400,000 a couple of years before were now a hundred thousand dollars in Vegas. Like it, they literally dropped 75, 80%. It was crazy. But the crazier part was, even though I thought they were great deals, I'm like, guys, this house was $400,000, you know, three years ago, but it's only a hundred thousand now. How can you lose? Um, people, other people didn't feel that way. They felt like, uh, you know, it was like a, a, a scary deal somehow. They thought that prices were going to keep going down and like houses were going to become free or something. I don't know what they thought, but me as a 21 year old, I'm like, guys, I don't know about you, but like, I've never even read rich dad, poor dad, or any of these books at the time. But I'm like thinking, dude, you can get a mortgage for like 600 bucks and this house is going to rent for like $1,200 and it's brand new. Like what, what is there to lose? Well, Obviously, even though I didn't know real estate at the time, I was right because common sense, you know, sometimes is the smartest thing you can do. Um, and, you know, I, I became a realtor and I just hated it because I, I hated dealing with clients. And even if I sold that $100,000 home, I was only going to make three grand, which to me was a lot of money at the time. But, you know, it's like and now you look at it and you're like, wow, that's not a lot of money. You'd have to sell, you know, 30 homes to go make, call it, uh, you know, almost a hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of sales to make, especially when no one had money at the time. So nonetheless, um, I ended up transitioning away from being a realtor after a couple of years. Also during this time, my wife and I, Mindy, or my wife, Mindy, um, who, you know, I was engaged to at the time, this was in 2012, 2013. Um, she was in college, you know, I'd failed as a realtor. I actually got released by the Oakland A's in spring training of 2013. And so like, 
you know, I get released by the A's. I'm thinking that being a big leaguer is the only way I'm ever going to make money. Um, I had already failed as a realtor for a few years and I was engaged uh, to my wife who wasn't working and accruing student loan debt. And so I didn't have any money. I was broke. And I'm like, dude, what am I going to do? Baseball's not it. Um, you know, real estate's not it. And I got to go provide for my wife. And so, you know, we ended up getting married in October. I'm about to celebrate 10 years of marriage, by the way, in October this year. So super excited about that. But, um, you know, we get married in October and all of a sudden, you know, I'm furnishing the apartment with money we got from the wedding, by the way, not money that I had made, but we got all these wedding gifts. And so I furnished the apartment and I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, I bet you I could probably flip this furniture for a lot of money. I, I got such great deals on it. I furnished it for like a thousand bucks on Craigslist and, you know, whatever. And, you know, sure enough, uh, I was like, you know what, what, let's just try it. And so I ended up uh, buying another couch on Craigslist that I thought was a good deal. And a few days later, I sold it and made a $200 profit. Well, that in turn led to my first successful entrepreneurial business. And um, I ended up jumping into this couch living business where I went from making a thousand bucks a month to 2000 to 4,000 to um, $8,000 net a month. It was crazy. And so for me, that was the first time I ever felt successful as an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, it was the first time I wasn't broke either. So, um, super just grateful for, uh, that experience. But it was during that time that I kind of got, uh, disgruntled even with couch flipping. Um, you know, and I was like, man, what's next for me? And so, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, praying, uh, we were on our one year anniversary in new Orleans and I was like, man, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And sure enough, I heard a whisper in my head that said, Hey, real estate. I was like, real estate, like, man, I already failed at that. What do you, what am I going to do in real estate? I don't want to be a realtor. And I just remember, I was like, you're going to be an investor this time, not a realtor. And I was like, okay. So, you know, long story short through just like, um, <laughs> a bunch of divine events. Um, I ended up finding this website called bigger pockets and I started listening to this podcast, um, with this guy named Brandon Turner. If you ever heard of him, put a one in the chat box, by the way, you guys can put my screen back so I can see it. Um, and I ended up, uh, you know, listening to this guy speak about real estate. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. Uh, I, I can flip houses. Like it was the first time I ever believed. And sure enough, I went back home with my wife and I was like, Hey, we're going to flip houses. And she's like, all right, well, let's do it. Um, you know, long, to, to not jump to the end, but, uh, it's funny now because 10 years later, Brandon is going to be speaking here in Las Vegas at my upcoming event, WealthCon. So it all kind of comes full circle, which is really crazy. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, I end up going in, I tell my wife, I'm like, we're doing this, let's roll. And, you know, she says, Hey, all right, well, you know, I trust you, whatever you want to do, let's roll. So I said, okay, but here's the thing. Um, you know, I don't have any money, so I'm going to have to max out our credit cards to do this. Okay. Um, and she's like, okay. So I ended up, um, you know, saying, Hey, let me, let me max out your credit cards. Let's, let's see if we can do this. She agrees. We ended up getting about $50,000 of credit, um, between both of us. And I said, that's more than enough. Let's roll. So we get this credit. Um, I do a balance transfer. You know, I had like that 12 to 18 months, 0% interest. Some of you guys probably know what I'm talking about if you've used credit. And, um, I was like, all right, this is going to be our down payment. We're going to use this to flip for the next year interest-free to fund our business. And so we did exactly that. You know, I ended up buying a house flip about, man, maybe a few months after that, my first one. Um, then I ended up buying another one shortly after for a full or a few weeks later. And so I was all in. I basically used the entire 50 grand to fund these first two house flips. And sure enough, um, I actually, you know, sold them both and made $40,000 between the two. So it was an amazing thing. Uh, I don't know if you guys can bring up the slide of the MLS, but yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. Like I always look back at this slide and I like to share it on some of these because it just shows, you know, how quickly your life can change with one deal. You know, I know all of you guys are probably struggling if you're still in stage one, like many of you are. Um, but I can just tell you this one deal can change your life. If you have one deal, all right, it, it gives you the confidence. It gives you the, um, 
you know, the, the strength to know that you're doing the right thing. And so that's what happened for me. So, you know, you can see this listing history right here on the MLS, you know, I'll never forget it. 205 view drive. Um, you know, I got it on, you can see on the bottom um, part, you know, I bought it on, let's see it. I bought it for $99,000 on March 10th, 2015. Right. I told you I'd made the decision in October of 2014 to like go all in. Um, I ended up getting this one in our contract and everything. And then we bought it March 10th. Well, if you look at the top screen, you can see that on March uh, 18th, I ended up getting it under contract. So I bought it March 10th. And within a week, I already had it relisted and under contract for 135,000. And then it sold on May 3rd. So in less than 60 days, I got a deal off the MLS for $99,000. I also got paid a commission as the realtor too. So I really got it for, you know, call it 96,000. Um, I didn't do barely any work to it, less than $2,000. As you can see from the two pictures on the left, they look the exact same really. <laughs> it's because it was. Um, and I made $25,000 on this deal in less than 60 days. Okay. And it was this one deal that proved to me that I could do this business, that the risk I took was worth it. And you know, that I was going to be able to succeed in this industry. So what I want to, what I want to like really stress to you guys is that one deal can change your life. One deal. Okay. So, and, and guess what? That one deal has led to me flipping, man, I'm, I'm probably over 600 homes now. Okay. Since then, you know, we own 550 plus rental units, you know, in our portfolio. Um, that's a mix of apartments, single family, Airbnbs, everything else. But guess what? Literally none of that happens without that one deal I just showed you. Okay. So how many of you guys, like, like we named this challenge, like how to get your first deal this summer for a reason, because I know if you get a deal this summer, your life can change for the next 10 years. All right. Like I just showed you that I bought that in 2015, eight years later, my life is pretty crazy, right? Like I'm making videos, I'm buying businesses, we got all these things going on because I got that one deal done. And I was hyper-focused on just flipping houses and dominating that. So put a one in the chat box if you believe that one deal can change your life, right? How good would making $25,000 on your first deal be, right? You don't even have to flip it like I did either, by the way. You could wholesale and everything else, which we're going to talk about. But if you had one deal, okay, not only how much like would the money help, but how much would your confidence grow? How much would, you know, you believe in yourself as an entrepreneur? Because guess what? You know, if you're like me, you've probably had businesses that have failed, okay? I have not gone, like, I have failed many times in my life. I've lost millions of dollars, okay? I've fallen on my face. Things have not worked out the way I've always thought they're going to work out. But guess what? Like, some things have. And, you know, a lot of times I do succeed. And when I do succeed, it's, it works out really good, okay? So I don't care how much you have failed to this point in your life as an entrepreneur, as an investor. You can have success, okay? There's something holding you back from success. And usually, it's a few things. One, it's usually some kind of false belief you have about yourself, okay? Two, it's usually a false belief that you have about something else, right? So you're either dealing with yourself and you're like, oh, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. I, 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 like, I don't have what it takes, right? You're, you're dealing with self-doubt, okay? Put a two in the chat if you deal with self-doubt. But then there's the other things that distract you, which are things that are out of your control that make you believe you can't do it. You're like, oh, is now a good time? Like, is the market too hot or interest rates too high? You know, uh, is there too much competition? Is there, you know, is there going to be a crash coming? Put a three if you deal with external forces that you can't even control that prevent you from doing this, right? You have other people telling you you can't do it. You got people telling you like, oh, don't do that. It's too risky. You know, there's, there's no way it's going to work out. People who buy houses lose money, you know? There's so many things that prevent us from achieving the success we want to have. And my goal with this event, okay, I can, I can teach you everything you need to know about Flipping houses, finding deals, finding money, and everything else. But if you don't believe in yourself, there's no way you're going to do any of it. You guys agree? Because if you don't have that first internal belief and you can block out all of the external noise and 
just get away from all of the negative media and everything else that prevents you from taking action, you can succeed, right? The media and everything else does not want you to succeed. They want you to be sheep, okay? They don't want you to have, you know, an actual brain to go think for yourself and make decisions on your own. They would rather you just fall in line with everyone else, okay? So do you want to be like everyone else who lives a pretty mediocre life their entire life and they never take a risk and they, they think they're playing it safe, but in reality, they're just trying to keep the mediocre life that they have, right? You know, for me, I share this a lot on my social media, so it should come as no surprise, but, you know, I'm Christian, and so, like, every day I share a daily devotional, um, you know, to try to uplift people and inspire them and just kind of, like, fill them up spiritually, right? Like, I'm, on, I'm trying to fill you up mentally with, you know, knowledge and everything else to improve your life, but I also know that the spiritual side is also another component of what you need, right? But... <laughs> It's th this reminds me of a story I was just reading um, in the Bible in Exodus, right? I don't know how many of you are familiar with the story of Moses and parting the Red Sea and, you know, how the Israelites were escaping from Egypt, okay? If you're, if you're familiar with the story, let me know in the chat. But the funny thing about the story is that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, okay? They were literally slaves for hundreds of years. And Moses comes to them and is able to get him out of slavery. He's like, you know, they do all the plagues, which you guys may have heard about, um, and he's able to get them out of slavery and escape Egypt, okay? So now, you know, they're escaping Egypt, and guess what? <laughs> Even though you got out of this really bad situation, it doesn't mean that life's going to be easy all of a sudden. It just means that, hey, like, I'm on the better path now, and I'm working towards the right things, right? So he's leading these Egyptians, out, or he's leading the Israelites away from Egypt, and then all of a sudden, Egypt decides like, you know what, let's go back and get them. We need them uh, for our economy. We, we'd rather enslave them than not enslave them, right? So they end up chasing them and the Israelites start complaining to Moses. They're like, Moses, why did you take us out of Egypt? We would have been better off as slaves. At least when we were slaves, we knew what was gonna happen. We at least knew like we were gonna be treated like crap. We at least knew that we'd have some kind of food for the table. Like we at least knew what was going to happen when we were slaves. But now you're leading us to this other thing and the slaves are chasing us and we don't know what's going to happen, right? We might die. I would rather, basically what they were telling Moses was, I would rather be a slave and leave a, live a mediocre life knowing that what my outcome was going to be versus take a risk of the unknown and not knowing how it was going to play out, okay? And unfortunately, that's what society does as well. They would rather take the predictable, boring, mediocre life that's safe and just do that forever versus take a risk and not know what's going to happen. But guess what? When you do take the risk, you know for a fact that you're giving yourself the best chance to succeed and have a much better life, right? I can tell you this. If you stay on this other side of life in mediocrity, you're going to live the next 70 years of your life with a mediocre life, okay? So you tell me, okay, especially because I know a lot of you are young. You think it's worth taking a risk and seeing what you got and seeing what's on the other side? Or are you okay just living a mediocre life and letting others dictate what you're supposed to do, right? Letting others control what's going to happen to you, okay? I don't know about you, but uh, that ain't for me, okay? I'm willing to take a risk. So if I got some risk takers in here, who are willing to step out in faith and see what happens, put a one in the chat box because you're my kind of people, okay? Because that's what I do, right? Every day I step out in faith, not knowing how it's going to play out. I'm starting new businesses. I'm making new investments. I don't know how they're going to play out, but guess what? I'm going to step out in faith and hope that they do. And I'm going to have confidence that it's going to work out, okay? So, you know, at the end of the day, um, that that's, I, I want to shift your mentality throughout these three days, I don't want to just give you information because information alone doesn't change you. It simply comes from taking action and believing in yourself. Okay. So I'm super excited by the way that we have so many people on and that you, like, it looks like the, the viewers are coming upwards, which is crazy. Usually like you get less viewers as time goes on. So uh, it must be pretty good content. Hopefully, hopefully you guys are getting value out of this so far. Um, but cool. So let's talk about this. All right. Today. We, we all agree real estate is 
the great vehicle to get started in. It's how I made my millions. Um, it allowed me to have the skills to start other businesses and everything else, right? Love real estate. The key to succeeding in real estate is getting good at finding deals, okay? I know many of you are probably thinking money is the biggest thing that you got to do and that money is like, you know, the end all be all, but I'm tr trust me, okay? If you find a good deal, the money will find you, okay? I promise you that. The money will find you, right? If, if I gave you, let's just take a hypothetical example, okay? If you had a house that was worth $400,000 and, you know, somebody, or, or let's say you find a house, it's worth $400,000 and the seller says, hey, I'll sell this to you for 250 grand, right? You probably don't have 250 grand cash right now to buy this home, right? You may not qualify for a loan, but do you think if you had that kind of deal, you could find somebody who does, right? Would there be somebody willing to go buy this house from you for any amount of money above 250 grand if it's worth 400, right? I, I think we'd all say, yeah, right? Put a one if you agree. Um, that's, that's essentially all real estate investing is. Like, you never have the money, okay? When I go to buy a $20 million apartment, do I have $20 million right now? No, but if I get a good enough deal, and I think this $20 million apartment's really gonna be worth 30 million, now I can go find the money to go finish off this deal, okay? So it always, always, always starts with the deal. And as we'll talk about in day two with funding, you know, all the different ways you can raise money are amazing. Um, but, you know, it all starts finding the deal first, okay? Real estate investing does not matter how great you are at operations or fixing up the home and making it look nice. If you buy a bad deal, it's irrelevant, okay? So let's talk about how to find deals, all right? I'm gonna pull back my board real quick and we're gonna go in depth on finding deals, all right? So I don't know if somebody can bring me a water too. I'm talking a lot. Let me um, grab a water and get, get clean again, Austin, right behind you. But are you guys getting value out of this? Let me know. Let me know in the chat what part's sticking out to you so far if you're getting value. All right, cool. Everyone's liking the value. Good, good, good. All right. I hope, too, you guys are getting inspired, okay? I'm getting fired up talking about this stuff because, uh, dude, <laughs> that one deal, remember when I showed you the one deal? That changed my life. If I can help, you know, there's 350 people watching this. If I can help, you know, 50 of you get your first deal, I mean, dude, that's 50 lives that are completely changed literally for the rest of their life. And so, you know, that's, that's my goal here. Man, if I can get 50 of you to change your life, great. If I get 350 of you to change your life, that'd be amazing. But I just know that that's probably not gonna be the case, right? I think at the end of the day, there's gonna be probably 50 of you who are serious about changing your life. You're serious about taking next steps and, you know, working with us and helping us or letting us help you take it to the next level. And um, that's my goal, right? I want to help 50 people at least get their first deal. So, you know, I want to see how many of you are going to be one of those 50. All right. Now, here's the deal. Okay. Let's talk about how to find uh, real estate deals. All right. There are three methods um, that people use to go about finding them. Okay. Number one is the MLS. Number two are basically referrals. Okay. And I'll talk about what that means. Um, and number three is direct to seller. All right. So let's go in depth on each of these. All right. So number one. Okay. Actually, I'll keep it up here. Okay. So number one, the MLS. Let's talk about this, right? That deal I showed you guys for my very first deal. That was an MLS deal. I got it for $99,000. Like I said, it was just on the MLS. Um, they posted it. For a, it originally got listed for $115,000. Um, I offered $95,000. I remember it like it was yesterday. I offered them $95,000. They said, no, you know, we want, it was like 105. And I said, how about $99,000? Like, let's meet in the middle and, and do this right now. They said, cool, we'll sell it for $99,000. Um, you know, I got it, uh, you know, for, for locked up. I then got a hard money loan, which we'll talk about in day two on how all that works. But at the time, just so you know, uh, I didn't have, I, I couldn't qualify for a conventional loan. I had bad credit because I had maxed out my credit cards. Okay. 
but I was still able to buy this deal. Okay, so don't let bad credit or you know not being able to go get a normal conventional loan make you think you can't buy deals. Okay, I bought a deal in 2015 when there was actually less money in the world than there is today. Getting getting money to go buy deals today is like super easy. Okay, so you know I'm on the MLS. I buy this deal. It's ninety nine thousand dollars, and you know as you saw, I flipped it for one hundred thirty five thousand. So the question becomes. How did I find this deal on the MLS, right? Well, the first thing is, obviously, you got to understand your numbers, okay? You got to understand how to run numbers, all right? Now, I'm not going to go into a full breakdown today of how to run numbers. Um, actually, you know, what this challenge is named after is, is Flip Your Future. It's a book I wrote. You guys can literally get it on Amazon right now. Um, and it goes over our formulas for figuring out, you know, basically how much you're going to make on a deal and how much you can offer and everything else. But, uh, you know, with understanding your numbers, um, there's things that go into it, right? You need to understand ARV, okay? That's your after repair value. And basically what after repair value is, is how much are we going to sell this property for or how much is it going to be worth after we repair it, okay? So even though you might be buying a property for $300,000, the ARV is 450000 because you know you're going to go put fifty grand of you know, construction into it. It's going to make it way more valuable. And then you're going to be able to get those higher comps, okay? So ARV is um, probably the number one thing you need to start learning. Okay, you need to learn that. Another one you need to learn are rehab cost. Now, on day three, when I talk about flip, I'm going to go over how to calculate rehab cost. Um, trust me, okay, I knew nothing about construction. Even to this day, I've never fixed one of my own houses. I, I don't know how. It, when something is broke at my house, I literally can't fix it. In fact, I called my father in law um, last week when I was out of town in Costa Rica, which is, by the way, another great way. That real estate's amazing is that, you know, you get to go on vacations, your business still runs. And then I'm looking at property in Costa Rica. And so now that vacation's a tax write off because I'm looking at real estate as part of my business. So <laughs> side note, but just know, like, I love real estate for so many reasons. And I'm actually buying a home in Costa Rica. So I'm super excited about that. But Nonetheless, um, I knew nothing about rehab. I knew nothing about construction. I kind of still know nothing about construction, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know how they build anything, really. Okay, But I do know what things should cost, which is the most important thing. You don't need to know how to swing the hammer. You just got to know what it's going to cost you to pay the guy to swing the hammer. Okay, So you know, we got to learn rehab cost. We got to learn holding cost, right? You know, there's not... Um, you know, like holding a, a property isn't free, right? You got to pay your utilities, there's taxes, there's insurance, you know? So you got to factor all of these things into the equation as you are, you know, um, you know, going through it. So holding costs are big, right? Another one is money costs, right? So I keep saying you don't need money, which is true, okay? But you, so you, you're going to get money from somebody to buy this property, Right? And so this is where you probably hear the term OPM, stands for other people's money. So other people aren't going to give you their money just for free. You know, I mean, you go ask me for, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. I'm not going to be like, here you go. Don't, don't worry about giving me interest or profit split or anything. I'm just going to be the nicest guy ever and give you this money. No, that ain't happening. Okay. If I'm going to give somebody money, it's going to be a donation, but I'm not giving you money for your business or an investment and not expecting to get a return. Okay. So, you know, there's cost of money, however, you're going to go about getting that money. All right. And then, you know, you got all your closing costs. Okay. So this would be like the title company, you know, all the fees you got to pay to the state, um, you know, your real estate commissions, all of that stuff. And you gotta, you gotta calculate it on both sides, right? You've got to calculate it. Um, on the buy side and the sales side, especially if you're flipping, right? So, you know, the first key is when you're on the MLS, you got to understand your numbers. You got to know how to run the formula, okay? Because once you understand what your ARV is, okay, if I know I'm going to sell this thing for 450 grand, 
And then I can minus out all these other costs and say, okay, well, I'm going to spend this much in renovation. I'm going to spend this much in holding costs. You know, my money is going to cost me this. You know, I'm going to spend all this money in closing costs. Basically, you now know what your break-even number is, okay? Because you, you're going to start from here and work your way down. Then you're going to say, how much profit do I want, right? Like at the end of the day, uh, you don't want to break even. You want to make profit. And so for us, what we typically aim for on profit, and this isn't like set in stone, but it's 10% of ARV. That's, that's typically what we're aiming for. So if we think that the house is going to sell for 400 grand, our goal is to make $40,000 profit. Like it's pretty simple. All right. So once you deduct all of those, then you're able to figure out your MAO, which is your max allowable offer. Okay. So let's just hypothetically, I'm, I'm not going to do this exact, but you know, if we knew that our ARV was 450 K and let's just say all the costs together were, you know, let's just say 50 K and then let's say we need to make 40 K, right? Well, that, and that's our profit, the 40 K. That means that basically our max allowable offer is 360 K. So that's the most we're willing to pay for this home. Um, you know, if we can get anything less than that, then we're just going to make more money, which is amazing. Um, but like, this is it. This is for, this is how you understand your numbers, guys. It's not as hard as you think. Okay. So for those of you who've never done a deal, okay, put a one in the chat. If this is actually uh, refreshing to know it's, it's not as rocket science as you think, right? Put a one, let me know. Um, but, but running your numbers is, you know, basically that, that that's, that's how you figure out how much you can offer on a property. All right. So, you know, you got to learn to understand your numbers and, and all of that other stuff. You know, what I'll tell you is all of these are pretty easy to figure out. This one, ARV, is the one that takes time. You know, I don't have enough time to explain how to figure out ARV. You know, we talk a lot about it in, in coaching, but, you know, figuring out that this property is going to be worth 450 is kind of like what makes or breaks the deal, right? And, you know, it comes from looking at comps and what other flips have sold for you know, how your house compares to other houses, you know, making sure you're using the right houses as comps, like all of that plays a role. All right. But, you know, once you understand your numbers, now you can start prospecting. Okay. We call prospecting, you know, basically like hunting for deals. Okay. So on the MLS, one of the best ways to prospect are auto searches. So with auto searches, basically I can set up a search saying, hey, you know, anytime a property that fits this criteria pops on the market, I want to get an email immediately, all right? So if you know that like a property that fits your criteria pops up, then you know it's possibly a good deal. So what are some kind of auto searches that you should set up? Well, I'll give you one and it's probably my favorite. And that's the price per square foot search, okay? So basically, how this search works is you say, you know what, you know, I know that price per square foot wise, properties in, let's just say the zip code I'm in right now, which is 89119, okay? I know that the, the um, average price per square foot in 89119 is, I don't know, let's just say $200 a foot, right? 200 bucks a foot. So that's pretty average, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up all the properties in 89119 and I'm going to go put them in, um, you know, basically search from greatest or from least to greatest price per square foot. So what we might see is like on the greatest side, there are properties that are selling for $300 a square foot, right? Um, then we might see on like the cheap side, there are properties that are selling for $150 a square foot. What I want is obviously those cheap ones. Those guys are potential value. So what I'll do is I will set a search and, you know, I'll go from the top and let's just say the cheapest is 150 bucks a foot. And then I will like go down a few, maybe like five. And I'll say, Hey, what's like the fifth cheapest one. And it might be, you know, call it 160 a foot. Okay. I'll then just say, okay, it's 160 a foot. Let me set my price per square foot search so that anytime in 89119, a property pops up, that is $160 a square foot or less, I want an email immediately, okay? 
And that's literally the way that I got that first deal that I showed you. I just set up a price per square foot search in every zip code here in Las Vegas. That house popped up as a good price per square foot. I then saw it, I identified it, I made an even lower offer than what it was listed for, and I was able to get the deal done, okay? So, you know, you can just do this for every property, and guess what? You know, if you're, if you're in a big market like Vegas or anything else, like, you know, if you did this on, say, 30, 40 zip codes, um, you're going to get probably 30, 40 emails every day, right? Now, it doesn't mean that all 30 and 40 are good deals. They're not, Right? They're just potential good deals. Like this is you prospecting. You're trying to generate leads that could be deals. And so, you know, you set up these auto searches and a few things start to happen, which are amazing. One, you start getting these leads, which are absolutely free, by the way. Like this costs you nothing to do, okay? You just got to have a realtor set it up for you, all right? So, you know, you do this and then you have your price per square foot. Every time it pops up, you need to now go look at the deal. So what starts to happen is you start to get better, okay? Because now you're looking at houses every single like day. You're like, let's just say you evaluated 30 deals every day and you're now starting to understand, oh, what does a good deal in 89119 look like? What are properties selling for in this area? You know, what are agents saying that I'm calling and making offers on, right? So, you know, you start to become better at knowing your numbers, you start to build more relationships, right? Because now you're talking to lots of agents and stuff. So, you know, relationships are key, which we'll get into in step two. Um, so I love the MLS as a starting method for you because it costs you no money. You get better at evaluating deals. You start building relationships and there's lots of deals on the MLS, okay? People still, like we still get deals on the MLS today, eight years later, okay? So, you know, prospecting is huge for the MLS, um, and you know, there's lots of other ways to get deals on the MLS, but you know, I'm already at an hour, man, this is going by really fast guys. So hope you guys are like, are you guys still entertained? Are you guys still with me? Um, because I, I know I'm, I'm going through a lot of information here and I don't want to overwhelm you, but I'm going to keep giving value. So MLS great way to get started, um, and build your skill set and everything else. Right. I want to make sure I have enough time for Q and a, so I'm gonna keep, uh, keep this rolling. Okay. The other way to find deals are through referrals, all right? So referrals can come from these people you've already been talking to, right? The realtors. They can come from, you know, people in the industry, right? So you start networking with, you know, loan officers and title company people and handyman and home inspectors and appraisers and, you know, everything else, you're going to start building up relationships that can refer you a deal, right? I've gotten many deals from referrals. Um, but, you know, the big one that you're going to hear a lot about are wholesalers, all right? So wholesalers are, you know, people that uh, find deals for a living. That's how they make money, right? Basically, all a wholesaler does is, you know, let's just say there's three parties here. You've got the wholesaler, you've got the seller, whoops, two L's, you've got the seller and you've got the end buyer. All right, so these are your three parties. This is basically how it plays out. Um, wholesaler, you know, basically gets a property under contract from a seller for 300K, all right? So that's great. Wholesaler knows that this is a good deal. Let's say ARV is 450, like we've been saying, right? Well, the wholesaler doesn't want to fix it up. They don't have the money. They just want to get paid quick. And so they go find an end buyer who's either like a flipper or a buy and hold person, whatever. And they say, hey, I'll sell you this property for $330,000, right? Okay. End buyer's like, hey, 330 is good. My max offer I would have paid was 350. So I'm going to make great money even. Like I'm going to kill it at 330. And so they say, yeah, I'll buy it. And so what happens is at closing, the end buyer now sends 300K to the seller. And actually, I should just to illustrate this um, better for you guys. Um, this should really just say, you know, contract. Okay. So, you know, the seller is just basically giving you the rights to buy it for 300K, right? Doesn't mean you're buying it, but you have the rights to buy it for 300K. Now, 
The end buyer, when they go to buy and close, they're going to send the seller to 300 k because they got the rights. The wholesaler is giving you the rights, basically, the 330 k the contract rights, um, to be able to go buy that home. And when you close, you're going to send the seller 300 k and then the wholesaler is getting 30 k as a wholesale fee. Okay? So, you know, it's pretty simple when you think about it, right? If you just find a really good deal, you got options. And this is what we're going to talk about in day three. You can either, you know, flip it yourself and make a bigger profit. You could wholesale it to an end buyer. Or in the case that we're talking about, you can just function as the end buyer, okay? and do the deal, all right? So, you know, you function as the end buyer, you can flip it, right? So wholesalers are a great way to find deals, all right? Now, this leads us to our last way, which are direct to seller, all right? So we're talking about direct to seller now. So what is direct to seller? Well, it's great um, because you now have no middleman. You don't have a wholesaler, you don't have a realtor, you don't have any of that stuff. Okay, you're going direct to seller. Me and you, we're negotiating. Guess what? When there's no middleman, I can get a better deal because I don't have to pay this guy, right? So direct to seller, you know, is really what you hear a lot about with marketing. Okay. So, you know, you're gonna now start marketing. You could do text messages, you could do, you know, we do TV commercials, you could do PBC, you could do you know, so many different things, right? But at the end of the day, um, direct to seller is a great strategy. And, you know, you got to get good at marketing to get to them. And, you know, you got to get good at sales because now you're the one negotiating with them, right? Now, the negative side of direct to sellers that, you know, it's going to cost you money to market um, versus MLS and wholesalers are free. But, you know, direct to seller is a, a massive one for us. We've gotten hundreds of deals doing this, okay? So, you know, for me, okay, the first 80 deals I ever did were strictly from wholesalers, referrals, and MLS prospecting. That's it. You know, I didn't even mess with direct to seller until after 80 deals because I knew I was going to have to do it to scale. So, you know, we'll, we'll teach you how to do this, but, you know, it's not necessary to get started. Okay. So, those are all the methods um, for finding deals. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into it. Um, so I want to kind of open it up for some questions now and, you know, everything else. But uh, let, who's got some questions real quick? Uh, start posting them there, and I'll, I'm going to start trying to address some of these. Um, and we can talk about real estate. We could talk about finding deals. You know, try to, try to relate it to these because we're going to go over funding and flipping and stuff um, in days two and three. And for those of you who are actually, you know what? Let me take a step back real quick before I start answering questions because I know a lot of you may only have an hour. Um, so I want to give you the assignment first and you know talk about expectations, all right? So the assignment, okay, for today um, is this, okay? And, and by the way, people who do the assignment, we're going to pick winners after the three days, okay? But here's the assignment for today, okay? I want you to go in the Wealth Building with Ryan Pineda Facebook group. Many of you are watching it directly from there. And I want you to do a live talking about why you believe you're going to go full-time in real estate, like why you want to do it. And then I want you to go over how you plan to find deals. Okay? Super simple. Right? Now, you might be thinking, why do I got to do that, Ryan? That's, that's whatever. I don't, like, don't want to be on camera. I don't want to do any of that stuff. Well, the reason I want you to do it is because if you just take one step of action, it's going to help you take more steps, right? If you can get one small win, that's how you start getting big wins, okay? So I wanted to give everybody a way to get a win today. And guess what? For the people that do it all three days, um, we're going to have special awards. We're going to be giving away free tickets to WealthCon. We're going to be giving away just a whole bunch of things. Some of you guys are going to get to golf with me. Like, it's going to be cool, all right? So I want to I reward those who um, do the you know, the assignment. And um, by the way, let, let's pull this up real quick on the computer. Um, for those who are unaware of WealthCon, like I, I, I talked about it um, a little briefly earlier, how Brandon Turner speaking, but, you know, it's an event that we hold each quarter here. Um, it's usually in Las Vegas and um, it's an amazing, an amazing event. Uh, let me back this up so you guys can see. So they're showing it here on my 
my screen real quick, but um, here are some of the speakers. You got Brandon, you got Bradley, Carlos Reyes, my buddy Derek Fay. Um, we've also got guys like Anthony O'Neill. Um, we've got Kelly Roach, Jesse Lee, my buddy Dan Martell. Um, you know, there's there's so many people that are going to be speaking at WealthCon, and I'm super excited about it. Uh, it's going to be amazing. So, you know, if you guys want to go to WealthCon, you know, we're going to be giving away tickets to those who, um, you know, are there. And, and you know, WealthCon's not cheap, right? Like our cheapest tickets, a thousand bucks. You know, we got tickets all the way up to five thousand, and we're going to be giving away some of those MVP level tickets where you're going to get access to people like me and the guest speakers and. Um, it's going to be amazing. Okay. So I see a lot of you guys are going to be at WealthCon. Um, somebody said I attended WealthCon Hollywood. It was absolutely amazing. Um, I'll tell you guys, our events are next level. You know, we have a lot of fun. We have a lot of networking. We have so many great speakers and it's unlike any other event you've probably ever been to because we have such a diverse cast of speakers and, um, you know, it's amazing. So, yeah. Um, I would love to see all you guys at WealthCon. Somebody said, Ryan, I have 25 grand to my name. Is that a feasible amount to start flipping? Absolutely. If you had zero, I would tell you, you could start flipping. All right. So 25 is a lot of money. Okay. So you're more than ready. All right. 25 grand is like totally good. And like I said, tomorrow during funding, we're going to talk about other ways to get even more money, right? Like 25 is what you got. That's amazing. But there are so many other ways to get way more money than that to start your business. All right. So um, WealthCon, the event, uh, totally love that. Also, too, you know, I want to give a shout out because I've seen some of them on the live right now to uh, some of our students. So, I mean, we've had so many students over the years. I don't know if you guys can bring up some of the testimonials, but, um, man, I mean, we've, we've trained thousands of people how to invest in real estate. And like I said, I showed you guys the screen of, um, you know, some of our – seven figure winners. But I mean, nothing brings me more joy, honestly, like I said, this at the beginning, than watching somebody get their first deal. Okay. Um, you can see a couple of our students here, um, just talking about getting started. Doesn't matter what market they're in. Um, and we've got testimonials everywhere. I don't know if you guys could just fly through, um, some of them on the back end and just, um, show them while I'm talking, but you know, I love seeing our students succeed. I love seeing them get that first deal. I love helping them achieve scale. I love helping them get in that multiply stage. Uh, it brings me a lot of joy. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not here to pitch you today. I'm here to just give you guys a ton of value. Um, you know, for those of you who are interested in our coaching program, we'll talk more about it tomorrow um, and how you guys can get involved and, and how we can really help you scale to the next level at Wealthy Investor. Hey, I hope you enjoyed day one of the Flip Your Future Challenge. I'm sure you have a lot greater understanding now how you can find the best deals and change your life. But here's the thing. It's so much easier to do this if you have a community around you, if you have your own coach helping you through that, if you have somebody holding you accountable. And we can do that for you at Wealthy Investor. And so it's pretty easy. You can book a free strategy call with our team by going to wealthyinvestor.com. If you just go check it out, you can book a call with our team or by clicking the link below. We would love to help you get to the next level. So check it out. Now let's jump into day two. Thank you guys for being on this, um, you know, day one, hopefully you guys had some great value. Um, while Javi was getting this set up, I'd love to hear in the comments, what was kind of some of your big takeaways from day one? You know, I saw a lot of you guys were posting in the, uh, wealth building community that we've got on Facebook. If you haven't joined that, make sure you do that. I know a lot of you guys are watching live from Facebook, but, uh, let me know. I want to know in the comments, what were some of the big takeaways you had from day one on find? You know, we talked about how to find deals. We talked about why real estate is such a great investment vehicle and why I think it's going to continue to be a great investment vehicle for you. Um, someone said, if you find a good deal, money will find you 100%, right? And today we're actually going to talk about funding. Okay, that's day two of this. So for those of you who um, missed day one, Basically, this is a three-day challenge where we're going to teach you every aspect of flipping your first deal. So um, day one, we went over find. We, we went over how to find deals, the different ways, how do I do it on the MLS, you know, how we evaluate deals, all of that stuff. Day two, which is today, we're going over fund. We're going to talk about how much money do you actually need to live? You know, how do you fund these flips that you're going to get under contract? And how do you create a lifestyle that you, know, you really dream of for real estate? 
And then day three, tomorrow, we are going to go over flip. Hey, how do you actually get the house renovated? How do you wholesale? How do you do these different exit strategies so that you can go make money and make a profit? So, you know, all that to say is it's going to be an amazing three days. Also today, too, I'm going to be giving you guys some WealthCon tickets for free. I'm going to pick some lucky winners um, who are on the call today and give them away for free. So um, you want to make sure you stay the whole time. Um, you know, for me, uh, definitely be here, you know, plan it out right now. If you, if you didn't know how long this is going to be, plan for at least an hour and a half. You know, I'm going to go at least to 1030 a.m., um, Pacific time here, and I'm gonna be doing some Q and A on the second half of the day. I'm gonna be going through a lot of different things, so um, make sure you plan that out. Get your notebooks out because we're gonna go over a lot of different things, um, and it's gonna be amazing. So, all that being said, let's talk about funding. All right. So, first off, before we go over how to get funding for your real estate deals, actually, I'll go to this camera. Um, let's. Let's talk about what do you actually need to change your life, right? So, you know, basically, what kind of life style do you want to live? That's the big question here. Actually, let me make this a little bit thicker. Man, we get a little delay. Actually, it is. All right. Anyways, so... You know, we're talking about what kind of what kind of money do you need to make to live the lifestyle that you want, okay? So for me, all right, we talked about the make, manage, multiply framework where basically I said, you want to get to at least making $250,000. All right, well, why is $250,000 the number? I mean, most people, they think, oh, if I make $100,000, um, I'm doing pretty good. I'm making six figures, right? Let me ask you this. For those of you who are already making $100,000 and you've got a spouse and kids, do you feel like it's a lot of money? Like, let me know in the comments. Do you think like $100,000 is making you live a pretty good life? You know, you're able to go on vacations, you're able to do the things you want for your family, drive the car you want, you know, whatever, right? No, basically everyone's saying no, all right? And it sucks because like that's the dream most of us were sold as we were growing up because you know, it's like, oh, you make six figures, you're doing really good. Well, I mean, in the world of inflation, it ain't really anything, okay? And if you live in California or any of these other places, you ain't making, like, 100000 is like, you're kind of in poverty in, in some places of the world, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, um, you got to figure out what kind of lifestyle you want to live. Now, I'll tell you this. Uh, for me, I, I always pick the number 250000 because... I think when you actually break it down, you can live a pretty dope life, okay? So let's just talk about this, okay? At 250 grand, let's just say, you know, you spend, uh, we'll call it 4,000, or, you know, we'll say 3,000. 3,000 a month on housing, okay? Maybe you own the house and it's your mortgage, maybe you, uh, you know, rent, but $3,000 a month gets you a pretty nice place to live in most places. Now, in New York, that may not be the case. In California, you know, it might not be that that crazy. But you know, in a place like Las Vegas, three thousand dollars a month gets you a pretty good situation. All right. Then let's talk about you know your car. Let's just say you know you spend a thousand bucks a month on a car payment. You know, a lot of people would say you shouldn't have a car payment, but we're talking about living a good life and we're talking about making two fifty. You can afford a thousand dollar a month car payment at that level. Um, you know, that's buying you probably a Tesla Model Y. I've got a Tesla Model Y. It's a great car, right? I think a lot of people would be happy with that kind of car. All right. Um, let's talk about, you know, food. How much are we spending on food? I mean, I spend a lot of money on food because I eat out like every day and I try to eat like five star stuff. But, you know, for the most part, if you're talking about, you know, like eating good, right? Not just eating, uh, you know, beans and rice every day, right? I think a reasonable budget for food uh, at this level is probably like $3,000 a month. I don't know what you guys spend, but, you know, I, I think you're eating good. You know, you're eating out, you're eating at home, you're doing all that stuff, right? But let's just start doing some math. Um, you know, you're going to have, you know, utilities and insurance and all this stuff. I don't know what utilities cost, but let's just say 500 bucks. Uh, let's now talk about like, what are some other exp um, expenses? You guys can 
uh, talk, put them in the chat. Okay. Cause I'm just going off the top of my head. I, my accountant and everybody just pays the bills. So I don't even know what things cost really anymore, but, um, let's say insurance, right? Insurance is a pretty big expense. If you have a family and your job doesn't provide it, right? Like I know my insurance is, you know, at least a thousand bucks. So let's talk about insurance. Okay. What else we got? Let's see. You know, we haven't gotten to discretionary spending yet. I'm just going over the essentials. Okay. So let's just say, um, you know, discretionary uh, spending a month. Okay. How much do we want to spend? Right. This would be like on entertainment shows, you know, vacation, travel, clothing, you know, at the end of the day, it, it really depends. But if you're going to like, let's just say you want to go on at least my thing is I want to go on vacation every quarter. Okay. So, you know, how, you know, balling that vacation is, is going to vary person to person, but let's just say, you know, every quarter you spend about $3,000 a month or sorry, 3000 bucks on your vacation. Okay. That means you're spending about a thousand dollars a month towards vacation. So let's put that right here. Okay. Thousand dollars a month towards a vacation budget. All right. Then you've got, you know, what else do you got here, guys? You've got, um, somebody said gas. Okay. If you got the Tesla, you don't worry about this, but let's just say gas. All right. Uh, and then let's just talk about discretionary spending. Okay. So the clothes, the, the meal or we already did meals, but like the clothes, the shows, all that stuff. Let's just say, you know, you want to live a dope life and you spend a thousand bucks, you know, on discretionary stuff. Right. Also, let's talk about the things nobody's mentioning kids. How much are these kids, man? I got a third on the way. Kids are not cheap. They are like literally leeches and ATMs. They just literally are hitting you up for money every second. You guys know what I'm talking about. Like, how much do we spend on kids at this time? Like, I don't know. Like, my kids are super expensive. But at, at this level, let's just say, you know, and, and if your kids are in private school, okay, this is definitely like a really big expense. If you've got daycare expenses, like, you know, kids can be really expensive depending on how many you have and, and what you're putting them in. But I'm just going to go out on a limb and say like $2,000 a month on kids. Just to put a number out there. I mean, everyone's number is going to be different, right? Um, and then, you know, we're missing the biggest one that nobody has mentioned, and that is taxes, okay? So if you're making 20 grand a month, basically, um, you're going to pay call, you know, depending on if you're married, let's just say you're going to, you're going to pay about 20% in taxes. Okay. So basically four grand a month of everything you make is going to go to taxes. Okay. So let's talk about this, right? We're, we're building out our like ideal lifestyle and, and where does that leave us at right now? Okay. So we got 3,000, 1,000, that's 7,000, 7,500, 9,500, 10,000, um, 11,000, 13,000, 17,000. So all in all, to live a ballin' lifestyle, you know, not, not ballin', but like you're doing really good, okay? You know, that's the cost, all right? And you're only making 20 grand a month, and I say only, because, you know, that, that gets you to basically 240K, 250K a year, right? So that leaves you $3,000 left over to donate, to save, to invest, and everything else, right? So, I mean, most of us want to obviously save and invest and, and donate a lot more than the remaining $3,000. But I, I want to just show you that 250 grand is like the bare minimum of what you need to like live a pretty cool lifestyle. Does that make sense to everyone? Like, you know, when you actually really start breaking it down, um, you're going to have to figure out how to make at least 250 K to, to do the things you want to do. You want to do more investments, make more money, right? My, my big problem is when people, uh, they, they kind of box themselves into like a budget. They're like, Oh, well, you know, all I make is this, so I got to cut here, I got to cut here. This is what happens, right? They cut, um, you know, what they would spend on their kids. They're like, guys, you can't have that. We can only spend 500 bucks on that. You know, they cut um, their discretion, they cut their vacation, right? They're like, dude, we, we can't afford to go on vacation. That's zero. You know, they say, oh, well, 
uh, I, I'm just going to drive a beater car, you know, and, and have a $200 payment, right? This is what we do um, for the most part, it, you know, for people like Dave Ramsey and everything else. They, they sacrifice on the, the lifestyle that they want because they think that their income is fixed and this is all they can do. Whereas for me, and what we teach at Wealthy Investor is, why do you got to sacrifice all this stuff? We're in the real estate world. We can make unlimited money in real estate. I mean, we got students, like Javi said, who are making over a million dollars a year, right? We got students who do six figures in their very first year of this business, okay? So 240 to me, and this is why I teach it, is the benchmark. That's like the minimum that we want you to get to because that's when you really can start living a pretty good life and, and doing the things you want to do and giving your, your kids the life that they want, giving your spouse the life that they deserve, okay? So... Can you guys all agree with me? Put a one in the chat if you think that 250K, like that should be the minimum that you are striving for to really achieve um, you know, what, what it is you want to do, the lifestyle you want to live, everything else. Because in the end, right, if you don't understand where you're trying to go, uh, it, it's not going to really help you as you're trying to get there, <laughs> right? Because if you're just, here's the thing, like most people have like no target. They're just kind of like, doing stuff and wherever the wind takes them and wherever their circumstance takes them, that's what they do. When in reality, if you have a target that's very clear and you understand how to get there, you usually get there, right? Like that's what happens with the best people. All right. So cool. Um, I love it. Appreciate you guys um, for sitting through that because I, I want to just make that clear. Like that's the lifestyle I'm trying to help you get to initially. And then as time goes on, you know, your lifestyle can increase even more. You know, it's like, this 20 grand right now is literally my mortgage. Like I just got a, uh, a refinance on my house. It was $3 million loan. The mortgage on $3 million is 20,000. So, you know, I got to make a lot of money to live the lifestyle that I now want. But guess what, right? I don't just sit there and say, oh, well, I can't afford it. I'm like, how do I make more money so I can't afford it, right? It's a mindset shift of what it is you're trying to accomplish, okay? So we know that, okay? All that. Now, other exercise I want you to do, right? That's the goal, right? I want you to think, what do you need, okay, to quit, okay? So put it in the chat right now, okay? How much money do you need to make before you're able to quit your job, you know, to pay all your bills and expenses? I already went over an example of like what bills and expenses could look like if you're making 250. Um, you know, most of you aren't at that level yet based on, you know, what we heard from yesterday, but how much do you really need to make to quit, okay? Um, because the sooner that you're able to quit and go full-time in real estate, the sooner you're gonna get to 250 and beyond, okay? Now, it's not gonna happen overnight, but, you know, you guys have gotta figure out how to do that transition, and that's what I wanna help you with. So somebody said 200K, um, somebody said 10K a month, you know, 100K, yeah, you know, some of you guys are living ball in lifestyles. You need 200K to quit. Man, you must be in, uh, you know, one of these expensive places. Let's see, retirement is 10 mil minimum. Um, so I guess just so you guys know, what I'm talking about is getting to the point where you don't have to work your nine to five anymore, okay? Doesn't mean like that's your end all be all. Like, you know, for many of you, I'd guess it's actually a lot cheaper than what you guys are stating. I'd guess many of you could start quitting your job today if you were making 6,000, 7,000 a month, right? Uh, doesn't mean that you're gonna go live this sick lifestyle that you're trying to live, but you could definitely quit at that point and now start going full time, right? So that's the key. Like we need to just figure out what's the minimum we need to make in order to quit and go full time. Because the transition period is the hardest, all right? When you're working a nine to five and you're trying to learn real estate, you know, you're doing two things at once, right? You can't just quit because then you can't pay your bills. So I get that. I'm not asking anyone here to quit tomorrow, okay? I'm just saying, hey, what do we got to hit first before you can quit? Then once you quit, once you're full-time, you're established, now you can get to that next level and start making that 250 and beyond, okay? So yeah, I see some people are saying 50K, 5K, you know, cool. All right, now that's a question you guys can all just answer internally while you're taking notes, all right? So for me, let me talk about my transition of 
changing um, and going full time in real estate. So I told you guys the story about how I was flipping couches, um, you know, back in 2013, 14, right? Right when I got married, um, I started flipping couches and it, it kind of was like my nine to five, if you want to call it that. That's what paid the bills. That's what, um, you know, helped me to know that I was going to be secure and like I could always rely on that. But, you know, around let's call it, you know, six, seven months into that, um, I started flipping houses. And did I quit couch flipping in that nine to five right away? No. And honestly, my house flipping business didn't have that much going on where like I was working 50 hours a week in it. Like I was very much just still trying to figure it out and all that. Well, you know, I keep flipping couches and, you know, I start having some success flipping houses. I flipped that very first house, which I showed you guys yesterday, you know, life changing, right? That one deal changed my life. Okay. Okay. But that first year in 2015, I flipped couches the entire time that I was flipping houses. Like I was doing both. Um, and I ended up being able to buy five houses that first year um, with really like not a lot of training, just kind of winging it, not knowing what I was doing. As I go into 2016, I still have the couch flipping business, but I actually hired somebody to help me flip couches, you know, on the side so I could focus more time on getting deals. And that was like the start of my transition. You know, when I hired him, I was like, all right, you know, I'm gonna let him do this. And like, I'm gonna focus my energy here. And once this, you know, for sure is like having consistent income, right? Because flipping is not consistent, you know, like it, it takes time. You gotta be able to stay in long periods where you're not getting paid. Um, I said, hey, once I have got enough reserves and once I, you know, have a, a good enough track record and deals in the pipeline, I'm gonna quit. Well, 2016, um, I probably quit, I would guess like halfway through the year. I quit and that was it. You know, so it took me about a year and a half of transition period to go full time at real estate investing. So, you know, the reason I tell you that story is you can be successful doing both. Now, are you going to go get to a million dollars, you know, working your nine to five? No, you're not. But that transition period is the hardest part. And so, you know, don't be mad if you're like, oh, man, if I don't quit next month, I'm a failure. If I don't quit, in six months, I'm a failure. Like it took me a year and a half and I ended up pretty good, okay? So you guys all with me? Put a one in the chat box if, if that makes sense to you, right? Like I don't want you guys to feel like failures and thinking you gotta go quit right away or take that massive of a risk. You don't, okay? With what we teach you at Wealthy Investor, you can continue to do that, provide for your family while also working really hard over here so that one day this replaces this and then it explodes once you're full-time, okay? That's what I want for you guys, all right? So let's talk about, um, you know, just e even everyone's situation's different, right? Like, you know, for me, thankfully at that time, I was a, you know, married guy. Me and my wife are young. We didn't have kids. So it's like that transition was easier for me versus somebody else who's maybe older. You've got multiple kids. You've got a spouse. Like, you know, if you're young and single, you literally have no excuse, okay? I have no, like, uh, excuses or sympathy for the young and single people. You guys should be taking a risk more than anybody else, okay? For every young single person that ever comes to me and they're like, Ryan, you know, I want to do this. I want to I want to take action, but, you know, I don't have a lot of money. It's like, well, yeah, you're young, okay? Young people are broke. That's just what young people are. Unless you inherited a bunch of money, you're broke when you're young. So how do you think you get past being broke, right? You take risk. And here's the thing. When you're young and you take a risk, guess what? If you fail, it doesn't matter because you were broke anyway, right? And you're young enough where you can recover and learn and then do it again, right? Whereas, you know, people who are older, you know, if you're in your 30s or 40s and you're established, you've got kids, you've got a spouse, it's harder, right? Like if, I, if you were to go quit a job and you got three kids to support, I get it. You, you definitely have a bigger risk, right? And it is going to be harder for you to transition. But what I'll say is, you know, being older, you should be more wise and you should have more experience and you should have a bigger skill set than the young person. And so, you know, the transition could be easier because you're just probably a little more talented than somebody who has no experience in the business world, okay? So nonetheless, um, everyone's situation is going to be different, okay? Um, for the older people, like I said, uh, I get it. 
It's going to be it's going to be tough, but you have your own advantages. For the younger people who are especially single, um, you guys need to get to work. Okay, you have nothing to lose. Okay, so I don't want to hear any young single people saying, "Oh, I'm scared to do something. What if I fail?" You are going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. I've made many mistakes. Accept it. That's how you get to the next level. All right. So let's talk about this. Um, you know, one deal can change your life. We talked about this earlier, but you know, I just want you to know, like, you know, my first deal, we'll call this deal number one, made 25K. At that point, I had never made $25,000 in, you know, a month. I've never made it, uh, like, in one check. Like, it was absolutely crazy. Um, you know, one deal changed my entire life, and it led down the path that I'm at today. You know, how many of you guys in the chat? Okay, put it to, would $25,000 change your life today? Like, how big of an impact would that have on you right this moment, right? Would you be able to go pay off some debts? Would you be able to take that vacation that you've been wanting? Would you be able to, you know, support somebody who you know that's been in need but you haven't been able to, right? Like, if you truly want to make impact on the world and help other people, you got to first fix you and take care of yourself, and be able to learn skills like this because other people aren't going to do it for you, right? Like, you know, a lot of us want to, um, you know, grow and help a lot of people. Well, it starts with you. You got to figure it out, right? So, you know, deal number one drastically changed my life and, you know, I'm grateful for it. Since deal number one, you know, we, we've had $100,000 deals, which, you know, the first time I ever made $100,000 on the deal, I was just like, man, this is crazy that we've gotten $100,000 flips. Then we had, you know, multi six-figure flips. I remember our first one for 250K. I was like, wow, we just made a quarter million dollars. Like what I'm telling you guys to make in a year, you know, we made it in one deal. It's crazy, right? Um, and then now, you know, for those of you who've been following me, uh, you know, I've got this piece of land I bought. I call it my mountain. And, uh, you know, I paid $620,000 for it about two and a half years ago. And now it's for sale for 6.5 million. Now, how much are we going to make? And, you know, what is it going to sell for and all that stuff? It remains to be seen. But, you know, it's going to be a multi, you know, million dollar profit. Okay. So I'm going to have my first multi-million dollar deal. And that's going to be life-changing when it sells and when it happens. So my point is, okay, and this is now eight years in that I got to this point. You know, I did 25K that first year. I think I got to a 100K deal maybe like my third year, you know, and then I think I got to my first 250K deal maybe like my sixth year. And then, you know, now I'm in my eighth year, right? So, you know, all of this stuff just happens um, as time goes on if you keep just getting better at the craft, all right? And so that's what I want to do, okay? So here's the deal. Um, I'm going to talk about different ways to find money to do deals. Like I wanted to get this out of the way for you and just show that like one deal could change your life, right? Um, actually too, let me just say this, okay? Some of you guys said, hey, I need to make 6K. I need to make 7K, you know, a month. That's what's going to allow me to quit my job. Well, you know, let's just think about this, right? If you're gonna make 7K, let's just say 70K, all right? You know, like that's the, you know what? I won't even say 70K. Let's, let's shoot for, making $100,000 year one, all right? How do you even get to $100,000 in year one? Well, I mean, you could do, I mean, truthfully, flips are crazy right now. I mean, you could do, call it two flips for 50K each, right? I mean, how many of you guys think you could find two deals this year, okay? If you had wealthy investor teaching you how to find these deals that I'm talking about right now, okay? $100,000 deals. $25,000 deals, luxury deals. Like how many of you guys think you could get two deals for 50K this year? Okay, if you had our help, our guidance, our coaches helping you analyze the deals, keeping you accountable, all that stuff. You guys think you could do it? Okay, definitely. Someone put a one, like lots of people. Um, like I believe that you guys can get two deals. Like two deals, not crazy, all right? But maybe you don't want to flip. Maybe you want to wholesale, right? Our average wholesale fee is over $20,000 right now. So let's just say that you got five wholesales, okay? So five wholesales at 20K a piece. 
that gets you to over 100K, right? Do you guys think you could get five deals? I mean, five deals is literally a deal every two and a half months, right? You think you can get a deal like once a quarter, basically? Okay, if you're, if you're actually learning and doing this business, okay, and you understand you have the right coaching, the right training, like, do you think if you had me in your corner, all right, do you think that we would go figure out a way to get five deals, five wholesales? We would, right? And, you know, the thing is, you don't necessarily need me. Like, our coaches and the teams that we've built are trained by me to go do it, right? And they train you to do the same, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, you, you only need five wholesales to get there. It's not a, a, a ton of money. Like, there's so many ways to go about it, all right? So, that said, okay, we understand how we're going to quit our job. We understand the first goal that we're going for in the make stage. And now it becomes, all right, if we're actively out there finding deals, how do we fund them? How do we actually buy them? Many of you are asking this. So let's talk about it, right? Ways to fund deals. All right. So I'm going to give you guys some game here. Get your notepads ready and let's jump right into this. So the first method to finding deals Whoops, I was, I was gonna put hard deals. That's not what I meant to say. Hard money, okay? So the first way that we fund deals is through hard money, okay? So, you know, what is hard money? Hard money is professional lenders who are in the business of funding basically fix and flips. Now, the cool thing with hard money is they don't care about the things conventional lenders care about, right? So when you try to go get a loan uh, for like a, a primary house that you want to live in, you know, they're going to look at your two years tax returns, make sure you've had the same job for two years. They're going to look at your credit. They're going to look at all of your debt, you know, your debt to income ratio. They're looking at all that stuff, okay? And, you know, the hard part is it, it also takes 30 days plus to close the loan. You got to qualify. And it's hard to get deals when, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to go get all these contingencies, you know, meaning like 30 days and like loans and appraisals and everything. And then like, why would the seller give you such a great deal? Well, it's really hard um, to do that with a conventional loan. Okay. Put a one in the chat. If you have struggle getting a conventional loan, like you've tried and you know, you weren't able to do it because of some reason. Well, that's where I was, right? I was flipping couches when I got started. I did not have a job. Like I didn't have a normal W-2. So if I tried to go get a loan, I was not qualifying. In fact, okay, my wife and I moved into our second house together in 2016, which was my second year flipping houses. I was making good money, but I didn't have two years tax returns yet from flipping houses in that business. So guess what? My wife actually had to get the loan because she was a, a middle school English teacher. She was only making $40,000 a year as a middle school English teacher, all right? And she was the one who qualified for the loan. Yet I was making six figures already in my second year, and I couldn't qualify. How dumb is that, right? Like, she's, she's the one that qualified for our, our second home back in 2016. And by the way, that second home, this is why real estate's so great. You know, we bought it for $200,000. Um, you know, we ended up selling it. Man, how, we sold it about two years later. I want to say for about $350,000 and it's probably worth like $500,000 today, right? Like that's, that's the power of real estate. Real estate um, appreciates, it goes up. Um, you know, it's an amazing investment vehicle, but nonetheless, uh, I, I feel all of you guys just pain with the lenders. Like it sucks that uh, they are the way they are. Okay. So if you've been denied for a loan, don't be mad. It's part of the game. I was there too. Um, even still I get denied for loans sometimes because guess what? Now I have a new problem. I have too much debt. They're like, Ryan, dude, you've got like 20 mortgages. Uh, how are you going to pay all those mortgages off? And I'm like, well, you know, they're rental properties. They pay for themselves. You know, obviously I have all this income over here. And then sometimes they're just like, yeah, but we have a limit. You know, we, you can't have more than 10 in your name and 10 in your wife's name. So you're at your 20, you can't do it. And so like, I've even had that happen. Okay. So you know, in the end, um, you cannot let conventional lenders stop you from getting into this business, okay? And this is the beauty of why hard money lenders exist. So 
as I said before, hard money lenders are lenders that professionally lend. Um, and so what they do is they charge higher interest. So you know, you're not getting the 6% loans that a conventional would get, but you are getting um, you know, speed. A hard money lender can close in less than two weeks. So it's the same as cash. Um, they're not going to look at your credit. They're not going to look at your debt to income. They don't really care about your two years. What a hard money lender really cares about is the deal. Okay? They understand that if you have a really good deal, even if you can't pay it back, they're going to be good because they're going to end up foreclosing on you and getting the property and making a good deal. Okay? So, you know, hard money lenders really only care about the deal. That's the thing you got to realize. And that makes it great for us because guess what? We go get a property for $400,000 that's worth $600,000. We can be secure knowing that we're going to have funding for it to buy it and make money. Okay? So, hard money lenders are amazing. And in fact, I'm going to give you a hard money lender right now because I want you guys to all um, just know this, okay? So one of the biggest ones in the world is called Kiavi. I think their website's kiavi.com, okay? They used to be called Lending Home. I have used them for, man, going on like six, seven years. Um, so, you know, great lender, give you guys some free game so you guys can go do that. But they, they work with new investors, okay? And they can help you out. And guess what? A wealthy investor, like we have special deals with them as well, you know? So... Um, our students can get some extra perks and discounts and things like that. But um, nonetheless, uh, hard money lenders are a great resource. And they will fund, you know, in most cases, 80 to 90% of the deal. Okay? So if you got a deal that's, like we're saying, $400,000, you're going to have to come up with forty dollars to $80,000. Now, many of you are like, Ryan, forty dollars to $80,000, where am I going to get that? Good question. That leads me to the next way of funding your deals. And that is private money. So what's private money? Private money is simply a person, um, you know, a friend, a family member who has money that is willing to invest with you, okay? Um, I've raised millions and millions of dollars of private money in my career. And, you know, with private money, they pretty much fund all my deals right here. They fund what I call the gap, okay? This is the gap of how much I need to actually buy this deal in cash because I know the hard money lender is going to pay the majority of it, you know, and then I just need a private lender for the gap. And, you know, private lenders are very negotiable just depending on what you guys want to do. You might go to a private lender and say, hey, I'm going to pay you interest, you know, for your $80,000. I'll pay you 10% um, interest, right? And the 10% is amortized over a year. I'll pay you 12% or whatever the case is, right? That means you know, every month at $80,000, basically you're going to pay them 800 bucks a month in interest. That's, that's what the math comes out to. Um, or you can go to a private lender and say, Hey, let's do a profit split. You fund it. We'll go 50, 50 on it. You know, that's how we're going to roll, right? There's lots of ways to structure private money, but the big key is just finding them and, and creating wins, right? Now, a lot of you guys are thinking, Ryan, I don't know rich people. Wrong. Okay. How many of you right now know somebody with forty to eighty thousand dollars? Put a one in the chat. You just got to know one person who's got forty to eighty thousand dollars, right? You guys probably all know somebody, all right? It's a, like there's a lot of people. I don't care what your situation is that have at least forty to eighty thousand dollars in the bank ready to roll, right? And guess what? They're not making money on that, right? They're sitting in a savings account making nothing. Somebody said you, absolutely. Guess what? I invest with my students. Okay? When they have deals like this and I know they're good, I invest with them. And guess what? Our students invest with each other too. Okay? We have wealthy investor students who bring deals and then wealthy investor students who fund those deals and they make money together. That's the power of being in a network. And it creates trust because you're both in the network. And so you both know that, hey, this person's pretty competent in what they're doing you know, and that this person's reliable to have the money. And so you know, our students partner together a lot. So it's amazing. But this is where you're going to end up finding the gap and, and funding these deals, um, you know, even if you get a hard money loan. You know, we call this what I call hybrid funding. It's like, you know, if you can get private money to fund this, how much money are you into the deal for? Zero. You now found a deal. You got it funded completely for free. Okay? So it's amazing. You know, another way to fund it is credit. Okay? You can go get lines of credit. You can go get a HELOC, you know, home equity line of credit. If you guys own a primary residence, that's a great tool to use to 
go and get, you know, access to capital to fund your deals. 100%, I agree with that. Um, I also think that credit cards are amazing. You know, I told you guys a story of how I maxed out my credit cards for $50,000. Like, uh, I'm a firm believer in using credit to fund your business, okay? People get, you know, loans to start a business, okay? Your business isn't flipping houses, okay? And you're gonna have to go borrow money from somebody. It could be private, it could be a credit card. I don't really care how you do it, but get the money to start your business, right? And, you know, buying a deal is one aspect. Buying education is another aspect. You know, getting materials and other things are other aspects. Utilize credit for all the things that are needed to fund your business, okay? So credit is a main one. Um, somebody said, who makes the monthly payment on these deals? So what we do with the private money is we, what we call overfund it. So if we only need 40,000 to close it, we know there's still gonna be, you know, the monthly payments, the utilities and all this stuff. And so we might just go get 60K, right? To go fund everything. So actually what happens in my deals is I actually get money back when I buy houses. Like literally I buy it and title wires me money back because they're basically wiring me 20K to go pay for all these expenses that are gonna happen, okay? So that's how you get through um, the monthly payments. But you know, credit is another great way to fund your deals, fund your education, fund your materials and other things that you're going to need. Okay. Um, another one is, you know, we talked about joint ventures. JV is for joint ventures. You um, can joint venture with our other students. And so, you know, if you find other students in your market, which like I said, we've got thousands of students. So there's definitely some in your market. Um, you know, maybe they find a deal and you've got access to capital and now you're making money because you're just funding their deal. You don't even have to find the deal, right? Or vice versa. You find a deal, they've got money and then they partner with you. Either way it works, you make money. You can make a lot of money in real estate <laughs> just being on one side. You're either really good at finding deals or you're really good at raising money. You know, I do both, right? I have a, a, a company called Pineda Capital where we go and buy apartments and everything else, okay? What do you think we do? Like our first deal ever, we bought a $20 million apartment. I didn't have $20 million. What I did was I raised $6 million from investors and I got a loan for the remaining $14 million and that's how we bought the deal. It is literally this exact method. So everything we're talking about, you know, for just like a normal single family home applies to, you know, the bigger deals too. Do you think that all these skyscrapers um, just get bought with cash? No, they go get a loan and then they raise investor capital to go fund the down payment and then they do the deal. That's how all of these developments happen, okay? So, you know, credit, JVs, they're all amazing. Um, I'm not going to get into this too much, but like another one is creative finance. So, you know, you can go subject to, you can go seller finance. This is like when subject to would be you taking over the seller's mortgage, essentially, to make it the easiest way possible. And then seller finance would be when the, um, the seller becomes the actual bank. They give you a loan to buy their own deal. So you would pay the seller interest. You know, there'd be all this stuff. Um, I'm coming up on time, so I don't have time to go into this fully in depth, but our students do a lot of creative finance and it's a great way to get into deals with no money, okay? So all of that to say, like, you guys can buy properties with no money. Put a, put a one in the chat box if you agree that you now believe, like, yo, buying a property, like, I thought I needed all this cash. I thought I needed, like, to qualify. I thought I needed all this credit. You now realize that's not the truth. Okay. And we didn't even get into wholesaling where you don't need any, any of the stuff that I'm talking about. Right. But you know, we'll talk about that tomorrow, but nonetheless, you guys can fund a deal and get started. Um, you know, I want to, I actually want to have my partner, Brian Davila come up and tell his story. Um, I don't know if somebody can go get him, but I want to have him go tell his story about, um, how he got started. So just to give him a quick rundown, um, you know, Brian was my very first student back in 2018. Um, you know, he was a realtor. He was, you know, just trying to figure out what to do. And, you know, he came to my very first workshop. This was back in 2018. And I taught him everything I knew about flipping houses. And sure enough, the next year, he went out and did it. Um, I'll let him tell the rest of the story. But um, he was my very first millionaire that ever came from, you know, this program. And then now, you know, five years later, we're actually partners in the business. Um, he first became a coach, then um, he started helping me in operations, and now we're partners. And, uh, you know, things like this challenge are from him. You know, he's setting these things up, 
and trying to add as much value to you as possible and, you know, help more and more people change their lives because his life was changed too. So Brian, you want to come up and, and tell a little bit about, what's up? What's up? tell a little bit about that first story. Uh, for my first deal. Yeah. All right. So my first deal was probably in like 2019. Um, at the time I was a realtor and I was only listing properties. Um, but I was getting extremely frustrated because I was listing a bunch of properties. Investors like Ryan would come up, <laughs> buy the property. They would make 50 to 60, $80,000 sometimes, but I would make like three. But I was the person actually going out and finding the deals and then just selling it to them. So what ended up happening is I had a mental switch once I met Ryan um, and I saw that he was doing a million dollars a year as a real estate investor. And I was like, hey, I want to make a million dollars too. If this guy could do it, I could do it too. Um, so I had a mental switch where I'm like, okay, the next deal that I get, I am going to flip it no matter what. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, list it. I'm not going to help them go buy a house. I'm, uh, I'm going to buy it myself. So I remember I got a lead, went to the property and, um, I made a extremely low ball offer, um, way lower than I normally would. Um, so for example, let's say the house was worth 450 fixed up. I offered 300, so $150,000 off the ARV. Um, for me, I felt super uncomfortable. Um, I felt embarrassed. I felt like, oh, this is stupid. They're not going to take it. And um, it's funny, when I made the offer to the guy in his front yard, he was like, all right, I'm going to think about it. I was like, okay. Um, didn't know how to handle objections. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just come back tomorrow and we'll figure it out. And at the exact same time, the neighbor from across the street came out and started yelling at the guy for his house being dirty, like while I'm standing right there. So I was like, all right, this is great. Like, <laughs> you know, now we got some more urgency because this lady's uh, threatening to call the city. Um, so she came out, yelled at the guy, left. I was like, all right, man, like, you know, what do you want to do? Because I'm at 300. This house is a disaster. You could see it. Like, let's do a deal. Um, he ended up agreeing to it. So he agreed to it. I was like, great. Got, got a contract signed. But I didn't have the money to flip a house at the time. Um, even though I was making six figures as a realtor, I didn't know how much it cost to rehab a house. I didn't know like the down payment. I didn't have all the details of the deal. Um, or I, I didn't know them. So what I did was I called an investor similar to Ryan and I was like, Hey, his name was Juan. I was like, Hey Juan, I got this deal for 300 K. I think once it's fixed up, it's worth 450. Um, can we partner on this deal? He told me, no, he was like, Hey, you know what? Really good job, Brian. I'll give you $5,000. And you know, if you bring me another one, we could double it. We'll, we'll give you $10,000 on the next one. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I, uh, no, like I, I already hit my ceiling of being a realtor. So I knew I didn't want to do it anymore. So I was like, Hey man, like, that's fine. If you don't want to partner with me, I'll just find someone else and then I'll bring you the next one. And he's like, wait, 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 you know, let's, let's, let's talk about this. And he ended up agreeing to purchase the property all cash and put me on title. So that was the very first time I bought a house without any of my own money and was actually on title. And I kind of forced him to put me on title because I knew a lot of hard money lenders want to see flipping experience. So I needed to show that I've actually flipped the house before. So long story short, put me on title. We flipped the house together. I ended up making like 40 to $50,000 net after all expenses. And from there, I got proof of concept and I just went all in on real estate investing. Uh, right after that, Ryan started the all-star program. I joined that. Um, I think in 2020, 2020 or 2021 was the first year I made a million dollars as a real estate investor. Um, and yeah, even I, it's funny, I was going through my car today and this is not promising any results, like just to be clear, but like, look at this. $242,000. Yeah. Yeah. A $242,000 check that I made from doing something as simple as buying real estate. Mm -hmm. It's not a complex thing. We're not teaching rocket science. We're not teaching you how to 
crack an algorithm. We're not teaching you some secret strategy that only the elite have access to. We're teaching you how to buy real estate. Very simple. So that's why I love real estate. It's tried and true. You're in real estate. I'm in real estate. No matter who you are, you're in real estate. Right now we're standing in real estate. We pay $15,000 a month for this space. So rather you're going to own real estate or you're going to rent real estate, rather you're going to build your wealth or you're going to build someone else's wealth, it's up to you. But that's why I joined Future Flipper at the time and went all in on real estate investing. So what did you make that first year flipping houses? The first year flipping houses, I think I netted like $500,000. First year. First year. But I could have netted more. So what I started to realize is if you truly make a lot of money net, because I focus on net, I hate gross. Gross is fake news. So, yeah. so if you truly net $500,000 after all expenses, you're going to pay a lot of taxes, mm -hmm. especially in California where I was living. So you could pay up to 50% tax. So if I make 500, I'm going to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes. So I was like, all right, I got to start buying rentals. So even though my income, I could have made more every single year. But at the end of the year, what I would end up doing is if I had like eight flips on the market. And once I saw my tax bill, I was like, all right, fuck it. I got to keep all these flips and do a cost segregation so I don't pay taxes. Yep. 100%. Well, guys, you know, a lot can change in your life, right? <laughs> I talked about my first deal changing my life. You know, Brian, by joining you know, the coaching program changed his life, you know, five years later, you know, multimillionaire. Now we're partners like it, your life can change quick. I mean, that was just five years ago, yeah. right? Like it's not a long period of time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed day two of the flip your future challenge. I'm sure you have a lot greater understanding of how to fund deals. I know for me, that was the biggest holdup that stopped me from ever getting into real estate investing. I thought I needed all this money. But in reality, there was so many ways I could have been buying deals and now you understand that as well. But here's the thing, buying deals involves a lot more than just funding it. You're gonna need help with the construction. You're gonna need help with building out your team. You're gonna need help analyzing the deal. You're gonna need help going through the process with different lenders. And that's what we can do at Wealthy Investor. We can help you get through those issues. In fact, we give you a personal accountability coach who's gonna make sure you're doing the right things and help you through any of the problems that are gonna arise. And it all starts with booking a free strategy call with our team. So if you wanna book that call, all you gotta do is just click the link below or go to wealthyinvestor.com and you can book the free call and we'll help you take those next steps towards your real estate journey. Now, that being said, Let's hop into day three of the challenge. Thank you for coming to this challenge. Thank you for um, attending day three here. Uh, if you missed days one, two, uh, we went over how to find deals in day one. We went over how to fund deals in day two. And today we are going over how to flip deals. So if this is your third day at the event, I want you to put a one in the chat and let me know that you've been here this entire time. Um, want to give a shout out to everyone who's been there this entire time shows me you are ready to take the next step in your real estate investing journey. So, you know, all that being said, um, as Javi mentioned, right, you know, this is the last day and I want to just make it clear, like we want to make sure you are able to take what we teach you today and apply it. So, you know, whether that's just going out there right after this and, um, doing one of the assignments and getting that first step or whether it is, you know, just, um, you know, taking it to the next level and joining the program, whatever else. We had so many people do it. So super excited about that. Um, I know our team's having some technical difficulties. So, you know, bear with us on the sound and everything else. Um, if somebody just wants to bring me a computer, that's fine. Um, so I can see the chat and everything else. Um, anyways, here's what we're going to do, guys. We are now going over how to flip deals. Okay. Let me talk about this. Um, when I first got started, guys, you know, I didn't really know what wholesaling was. So many people asked me, they're like, Ryan, um, you know, I started out as a realtor and people were like, Ryan, you know, you need to flip houses. That's where the money's at. You need to buy rentals. That's where the money's at. Nobody was really talking about wholesaling back in 2010 when I first got started. Okay. Um, there wasn't like YouTube channels. There wasn't, you know, TikTok. There wasn't all these podcasts teaching what wholesaling was. You know, all I had to go off of was the TV shows um, that people were doing, like Scott Yancey. You know, if anyone remembers that Flipping Vegas show, um, I always watched that 
when I was growing up. Cause I was like, man, dude, like if I could just flip houses like this, I can make great money. Um, so flipping houses was the main thing that I wanted to do. Um, from there, you know, I didn't flip a house until two, I got licensed in 2010 and I wasn't able to flip a house until 2015 because I didn't have the knowledge and things that I told you guys yesterday with funding. I didn't know about hard money. I didn't know about private money. I didn't know about, um, you know, creative finance. I didn't know that I could just go get lines of credit or utilize my credit cards. And, you know, I, I had all these beliefs that many of you had yesterday of that, oh, I need great credit. I need two years tax returns. I got to get conventional loans. Like, that's absolutely not the truth. You know, at the end of the day, um, you can succeed with nothing, really. I mean, and we're going to talk about that today on the flipping side. We're going to have, um, we're going to go over wholesaling. We're going to go over burrs. We're going to go over how to actually flip the house um, with a contractor and, you know, give you guys some best practices for that. So if you're excited today, give me, a, give me some love in the chat. Let's get it going. Um, put a two in the chat. Tell us where you're from. Let me know. Let's make something happen and let's jump into the training. So first off, okay, I'm going to bring this up. All right, cool. Now I've got my uh, slides and everything. So that's great. All right. We are going to talk about how to find or how to flip these deals. Okay. So as we said before, okay, here we go. Day one. You know, we talked about finding deals. I'm just going to recap for two minutes, okay? So, you know, we went over the MLS, how we do that. We went over wholesalers, how we do that. And we went over direct to seller, okay? So for us, you know, if you're able to go direct to seller, you're going to get the best deals. Wholesalers are going to do all the work for you. And MLS is a great way to get started. That's how I got started, okay? From there, okay? Okay. We went over, well, let me go down here. From there, we went over on day two, okay? Day two, fund, okay? How do we fund deals, okay? So we talked about private money. We talked about hard money. We talked about creative, okay? Credit, and even joint ventures together, right? So we know how to fund deals. Let me add the E there. So we know how to fund deals. We know how to do all of that. And by the way, I see a lot of people from Texas, Kansas City, New York, New Orleans. Man, everybody's from all over. That's amazing. A bunch of you guys are from Vegas, my hometown. So I love seeing that. Um, but day two, we went over fund. Okay. Now, once you find a deal and you have the, the capital to um, buy it, you now need to flip the deal, right? That's what we're going to be discussing here on day three. Okay. So day three today, we're going over how to flip the deal. So let's talk about this, right? When you're going to flip the deal, there are multiple exit strategies that you can take, all right? So what are some exit strategies that happen with real estate investing, okay? We'll go over some of these strategies, okay? As I was saying, when I got started in 2010, I was a realtor. We didn't really know about wholesaling. Um, you know, it, it just wasn't really that big of a thing, but... You know, one of one exit is to just flip the property, meaning you're gonna buy, renovate, okay, and sell. You know, traditional HGTV flip, right? Buy, renovate, sell. Strategy two is you're gonna wholesale. Okay. We talked about what wholesaling is. You're just going to assign the contract. Okay. Method three is rental, all right? Now, rental can have lots of different things. We're going to talk about Airbnb. A lot of you guys are interested in Airbnb. Put a three in the chat, by the way, if you're interested in Airbnb. I, I, I wanted to, I'm just curious how many of you guys are trying to get into that. You know, obviously, you got Airbnb. Um, you could utilize the Burr strategy, you know, or just, you know, a regular rental, right? So... We got lots of exit strategies. Okay, a lot of you guys are interested in Airbnb. That's good to know. All right, so we have lots of different exit strategies we can take on the flip stage. So which one is best, right? How do you know which path to take? Should you flip? Should you wholesale? Should you buy a rental? Like that's the big question to ask ourselves. Well, here's my opinion, okay? If you are just getting started, 
Okay. Tell me this is buying one rental going to, you know, make you quit your job. You know, just put it in the chat. Do you think that you're going to quit your job um, and, and be good by buying one rental? Right. Just let me know. Okay. Someone said, no, no. Like, I don't think you guys are going to quit your job buying one rental. Right. But you know, if you flip one or wholesale, or let's just say you flip one and you make $40,000, okay, or you wholesale and you make, I don't know, 20000 I mean, you don't have to do too many of those to, you know, get to the next level. Somebody said, I got nine rentals and I haven't even quit my job. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but so many people think that if they accumulate a certain amount of rentals, they're going to be able to quit their job. <laughs> and that's just not the case. The reality is um, there are very few people who actually live fully off their, their rental income, right? And, you know, even if you got to that point where you were making, you know, seven to $10,000 a month just from your rentals, it's like, well, it's not, you're, you're still not balling, right? Like at, at the end of the day, how much, like how big of a lifestyle do you want, right? Um, if you get really good at accumulating rentals, then why aren't you flipping and wholesaling so you can make an active income too? Like that's my philosophy. So, you know, rentals have their place, but if we're trying to go full-time in real estate and we're trying to like really change our lives, I mean, we got to get big chunks of cash. I mean, that's the reality of this situation, okay? Now, if you're working a nine to five and you're happy with how much you make and you don't want to go into real estate, then buying rentals is good, all right? So if any of you guys are in that boat, let me know. Put, a, put let me see, a four. I haven't used the number four in a while. Put a four in the chat if you're good with your current job and it's not even in real estate and you're just like, yo, I'm making money, I'm saving, I'm getting good at my job, I wanna just start buying rentals or Airbnbs or whatever the case is, okay? All right, so we got a few fours, good. All right, so... Here's the thing, guys. For those of you who, who put the fours, everything we talked about in day one and day two um, applies because you still got to find good deals, all right? Then you still got to go raise capital to buy those deals. It's just that when we get to the exit strategy, we're just going to keep it as a rental. That's it, all right? So um, I have lots of rentals, but I still flip. I still wholesale. And so for me, um, that's, that's what I teach. I'm like, look, if you just get great at finding deals and you get great at raising money and having people who like buying real estate from you, buyers, you're good. You could choose whatever you want. You could flip, you could wholesale, you could buy a rental because you have the gold. The person who has the deal has the gold. Okay. So how do you know what to do? Well, here's the thing, guys. Let's just say you raised enough money to flip the deal, right? So we're going to talk about flipping first. Now, obviously, you're going to have to go raise capital. Um, we talked about how to do that with private money and hard money and everything else, right? Okay, you're going to go raise capital, and then you are going to um, have to now renovate, okay? So this is where people get tripped up, and I want to talk a little bit about renovating a home so that you don't get screwed, okay? That sound good? I don't want you guys... By the way, you can get screwed in lots of ways during renovation. One way is, obviously, you pick a bad contractor, they overcharge you, they quit, you know, they, they do all those things, right? I, I've been there. You know how many times I've lost money from contractors? A lot. These guys just sometimes leave, you know, their job. Uh, they, they bounce. Some people, you know, all of a sudden they hit you with all these change orders and, you know, they, they weren't stuff you agreed on and they lean your house. Like I've been through all of those things. All right. Or you get a contractor who doesn't end up paying their subcontractor. And now the subcontractor is going to you. Has, have any of you guys ever experienced that? Okay. Like that's something that's happened to me um, a few times. All right. So, you know, when we go into renovations, we got to do things that make the deal safe. All right. So I'm going to give you some quick tips. I want to give you, uh, I'm just going to give you five tips off the top of my head. All right. I don't even have these prepared, but I'll give you five tips. Okay. Number one, this is the main thing. Copy the comps. So whether you're trying to flip or um, keep it as a rental, you want to make sure you're copying the comps. And what I mean by that is don't do a renovation for how you like the home, okay? You might like some weird style and you're like, oh, this is what I would want. I think this looks good. I saw it in a magazine. You know, they did it on this HGTV show. Don't do that. 
okay? Like you just have to copy what's already been done. So the comps are the comparables, okay? Those are the homes that you are looking at when you're determining your after repair value. We talked about after repair value yesterday, or um, I think day one, we talked about ARV. So when you're looking at your comps, which is what you're doing when you're looking at your ARV, look at what they had. You know, do they have white cabinets? Do they have gray or white paint? You know, are they going ultra modern? Are they going brown tones? You know, um, what kind of finishes are they doing? Like how expensive? Is it cheap, cheaper countertops? Or, you know, is it high, high end marble? And like, you know, they're, they're island waterfalls. Here's the thing. A lot of people waste money on construction because they overdo the property, right? When we look at a deal, we'll look at it and we'll say, hey, you know, if we put $30,000 into this house, you know, it's going to make us an extra 60000 and we're like, all right, that's good for us. Two, two to one on the money, right? There are some of you who will be like, oh, well, I want to put 50000 into the house. And it doesn't make you 100000 more. In fact, it, it might actually lose you money because the value of the house is capped, right? You might have an appraisal issue early or later on because you're trying to set a whole new comp that hasn't happened yet, all right? So we never want to over-renovate a home. All right, that's just how you're gonna lose money. So rule number one is copy the comps, okay? Are you guys all with me on that? Can you guys agree that you know we're not gonna just go over the top or do what we wanna do? We're gonna do what the market demands, what has already been sold, what um, you know has proven to work, all right? I don't need you guys to go and reinvent the wheel. Let's just do what's already been done and proven, all right? So that's number two, or number one, copy the comps. Um, here's number two. Let's get multiple bids, all right? Now, as much as it, you know, you, a lot of these contractors want you to just only use them and they don't want to compete, like you have to get multiple bids, all right? You, you can't just take the first glance and, and be like, oh, that's good, all right? So for me, when I'm, if I was getting started, I would get multiple bids from multiple contractors. And the reason for doing that would be because, number one, I'm going to see if like the bids are actually competitive, Okay. Number two, I'm going to get different ideas from different contractors. They're now going to give me, um, you know, just different things. And they're going to be like, hey, I would do this or I would do that. Hey, I, I did one over here and it did really well. You know, they're going to have different ideas. So getting multiple bids is good. And then you're going to be able to get, you know, whatever the best bid is. Now, you got to take those bids and really like look at them. You don't want to just take the cheapest bid. Okay. Like the cheapest bid isn't always the best bid. In fact, it might be wrong. Somebody might be giving you a super cheap bid because they want to get the job. But then, you know, by the time you get there, it was the same bid or even higher than the other ones because they just bid it wrong or they were withholding other things. Okay. So you want to get the best bid, the guy you're most comfortable with, you know, and you're, you should have a general idea of what it should cost when you're getting multiple bids. I suggest getting at least three. All right. Here's another thing with contractors. All right. Um, you know, price per square foot method. Okay. We talked about the price per square foot method, um, you know, with finding deals in the MLS, but we utilize the same thing for estimating construction cost. So, you know, basically what we do is, you know, if it's going to be a full renovation here in Las Vegas, and when I say full renovation, I'm not talking like we're ripping plumbing out and we're ripping electrical out, you know, the, the kind of stuff you see on these homes that are you know, a hundred years old. We don't do that here in Vegas because our homes are pretty new. I mean, most of the houses we flip are maybe 30 years old, 40 years old. Um, you know, we get a little older, but for the most part, we don't need to go, you know, inside the walls and change all this stuff. It's good. Okay. We're really doing like a cosmetic rehab. Like we're making it look sick from the outside, but the bones and the interior are the same. So if we're going to do a full renovation like that, that's what I call full renovation. I know we're going to probably spend about $30 per square foot. Okay. So what that means is if I have a 2000 square foot home, okay. And I'm going to just fully renovate this thing head to toe. I mean, I'm probably going to spend 60 grand. I mean, that's just what it comes down to. I mean, it could be less, it could be, you know, 50 K whatever, but at the end of the day, you're going to want to just have a general idea because you don't have time to walk every property and be like, Oh, you know, uh, I got to go get everything itemized and all that stuff. 
No, what happens is during the stage of finding the deal, you're gonna use this price per square foot method to just get an idea of what your renovation could be, all right? And so if you use this method, you're gonna say, okay, my renovation's gonna be $60,000. You know, and then you plug that into the formula that we talked about in day one, and all of a sudden you now have an offer that you can make. And let's just say they accept your offer, all right, based on the 60K, and you think that you're going to make the profit you want to make. Well, the next thing you would do is now you would go get the multiple bids and verify that this number is going to be true, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, if, you know, the number was, uh, if it ended up being 50K, and you budgeted 60, you're going to make more money. You know, if it ended up being 70K and you budgeted 60, you may need to go back for a renegotiation with the seller because now, you know, the deal may not make sense, right? Makes sense? Okay, you guys understand that? You know, somebody said, and, and by the way, this $30 a square foot, this is going to vary state to state. You know, some of you guys, it'll be more expensive. Some of you guys will be less. You know, I'm just giving you, you know, kind of the number that we use to estimate. You know, at, at certain points, we used to use you know, anywhere from 20 to 25. And it could still potentially be that for maybe a home that's not going to be as nice of finishes, or maybe there's a couple of extra things we don't really need to do. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, price per square foot is going to be big for um, doing construction, right? Fourth thing, you know, you got to prospect contractors, Okay. So you got to always be looking for more and more contractors if you are going to do this. Um, you know, where do you find these guys? I mean, you could go to Home Depot and just stand in front of the line and watch all these guys. Uh, there's one I call dumpster driving. Okay. So we're not actually, you know, what do they call it? Dumpster diving when you go in the dumpster. We're not doing that. All right. We're dumpster driving. So anytime you see the big dumpsters in front of a house, that means that there's construction going on. All right. So, you know, at the end of the day, what I would do is when I was driving my flips and stuff, I would see other flips in the neighborhood. Typically, like na certain neighborhoods have certain flips. And, you know, I would just go knock on the door when I saw those big dumpsters. I'd be like, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a real estate investor. My name's Ryan. Um, are, are you guys doing construction here? And, you know, obviously they are. And you're like, well, I'm looking for more contractors. Are you interested in more work? And of course, they're going to be like, sure. You're like, all right, well, can I actually tour the house and see the quality of what you guys are doing? And a lot of times they'll just let you in, um, you know, and then you'll be able to go do it. So you got to constantly be prospecting um, for more contractors. But, you know, another thing is just referrals. We always talk about referrals, and I think that's always going to be good. I think you can get referrals from, you know, Facebook groups. You can get referrals from, you know, our wealthy investor coaching program. Our students are always doing referrals. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to find. But the key here is this with uh, contractors. Don't ever rely on just one, all right? And, and this is every aspect of this business. As you scale, you cannot rely on just one person for anything. I can't only rely on one method of finding deals, you know, in marketing. I can't just rely on one agent to help me. I can't rely on one contractor and expect them to do everything. You know, I can't rely on one lender and expect them to do everything, right? Now, when you first get started, yes, you only need one lender. You only need one contractor, right? You're only doing one deal. But I'm just saying you should always be prospecting um, and building your team, like everywhere, all right? So, yeah, basically, you know, I want you guys to prospect. And then, you know, lastly, here's tip number five. You know, verify slash check in. So... The only way that you are going to make sure your project gets done is if you're constantly there checking in, right? Our, our project managers right now check in two times a week, all right? They're making sure that the project is getting done, um, and the contractor knows if, if they're not, uh, you know, if, like, I go there. Well, I don't go there. But if my project manager goes there, and they're not there, and work's not getting done, hasn't gotten done in the last three days, I know they haven't been there. They haven't been working, right? which tells me either they're lazy or they're on another job site, which either way, it's not good. So by checking in, we're able to call them and say, hey, I was there. Nothing's gotten done. You know, if you don't hit your schedule, there's going to be consequences. Okay. So by just checking in and visiting the property, you know, you're going to keep it moving quicker. And 
you know, you're going to be able to verify what's actually happening when you cut checks, right? Because the last thing you want to do is go, you know, they, they call you up and they're like, hey, I need a check. And you're like, okay, cool. Is it getting done? And they're like, yeah. And you don't even verify or check. That's how you lose money. All right. So you got to make sure that you're verifying and checking in. So, you know, those are just five tips. I mean, we talk a lot about construction in the coaching program. There's, there's so many aspects to it with having the right contracts, having, you know, um, good, like we, we give our students an entire um, sheet that is itemized. So they can just walk through a property themselves and input it into the Excel sheet and say, oh, this needs five light bulbs. This needs, you know, five fans. This needs 2,000 square feet of paint. And it will auto-calculate how much the renovation is going to be at that home. Now, obviously, each market, you got to tweak the numbers. But um, these are the kinds of tools that we give our students to make them so much better. Because guess what? I mean, these were tools I created for myself because I just kept getting, um, you know, I just kept getting screwed, really. I kept losing money on dumb things. And I'm like, finally, I'm just going to create a tool like this so I don't have to do that. You know, another tool I created was our contractor's guide. Basically, it's a guide that I give, or I give every single contractor, and it has everything from head to toe. It has the exact flooring we use, the exact color of paint, the exact cabinet, the exact you know light fixture. So that way, all of our flips look the exact same, no matter where they are. You know, it's a Ryan Pineda flip. Okay, so you know, for me, uh, like I've created things like that. I've created contracts for your contractors. Right, they're gonna have their own contract that's skewed in their favor, right? If they're going to work with you, give them your contract and it's going to have timelines they need to hit. It's going to have deadlines, payment schedules, all that stuff, right? Another one is lien releases. You know, the moment they're done with that job, they need to sign a lien release so that they can't ever do anything later on, right? So like all these tools, we give it to you in the program. And this is just on the contractor side, right? Like we have so many other tools available. And by the way, um, some of you guys uh, who were here on day two, I mean, shout out to, I mean, we had so many people sign up for the program already, but I'll just put it here again for those of you who are like, hey, how do I get these tools? Um, if you go to wealthycall.com, okay, let's talk about, you know, the rest of this, right? So you do the construction, you flip, like the house is ready now, you, you've done some different things that um, are getting it square and good, but now you know, you've got to list the property, right? So, you know, obviously with listing, you need a good realtor. My advice is if you're early on, you know, get a realtor who's represented other house flips, who's pretty experienced. Don't just go take your friend who um, <laughs> you just know. And you're like, oh, there's my friend. Uh, I'm just going to let him list my property. Like, no, dude. Okay. So make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're getting a good realtor who's got experience. Don't just take your friend, all right? And your friend might get mad at you. I don't care, okay? If your friend gets mad at you because you didn't use them, it's your friend, okay? So you got to get a realtor to list it. You know, if they do what they're supposed to do, this should be pretty hands-off for you, all right? So, you know, I, I'm not going to go in depth on how to price a property today. I'm not going to go in depth on, you know, like you, you want to obviously get good photos. You want to make sure you got a good description and all that stuff. But if you get a good realtor, they should do all that for you. All right. So, you know, once you list it, obviously you get offers and then hopefully, you know, those offers close and you make a profit. Now, here's the thing with flipping houses. There's, there's two things at play here. There's risk versus reward. Okay. Oh, reward. So the risk is when you flip a house, obviously you're putting money on the line now. And if the market turns or something happens, you could potentially lose money or make less money or whatever the case is, right? But the reward is even if things stay the same, you're going to make more flipping the house than you would have wholesaling, okay? Or if you're in a market right now where it's super competitive and things are going up again, then you're probably going to get an even bigger profit than you thought. You know, that happened to us um, you know, probably for like two years after COVID, every deal we bought, it was like, uh, we, we, we thought we would make 30 or 40 K on the deal. And then we would make 60 to 80 K just because the market was appreciating so fast. Okay. But then vice versa happened, right? The market slowed down last year when they raised rates. And so we lost money on deals too. Like I'm, I'm being transparent with you guys, right? Like I don't always win every deal. 
right? But in the span of eight years, I'm way ahead, <laughs> even with losses, okay? And so, you know, there's always risk versus reward with flipping. Um, you know, a lot of people are scared to flip starting out because there is more risk than wholesaling, and that's totally cool. I'm not saying you guys got to all flip tomorrow, but, you know, as, I'm, as I keep saying, like if you're in the coaching program and you've got an accountability coach and you've got community and you know what you're doing, you're running your numbers the right way and you're doing the things that we're talking about, your risk is going to significantly be less, okay? So keep that in mind, right? We have a lot of students who do their very first deal flipping, right? Okay, so that's pretty much flipping in a nutshell um, on the exit strategy side, right? Now let's talk about wholesale. So... Wholesale is great because guess what? All you got to do is find an end buyer, all right? You don't even need a lender or anything, okay? If you find an end buyer like me, you know, I'm going to do the pretty much the heavy lifting, okay? So think about this. For those of you in Las Vegas, okay? There's a bunch of you in Las Vegas. Put a one in the chat if you're in Las Vegas, just so I can see you. Um, if you're in Las Vegas and you found a deal and you didn't want to flip it, well, guess what? You got an end buyer right here. I will literally buy the deal, okay? So you don't have to worry about whether or not you could sell it. And if you're in any other state and you're a wealthy investor, you've got students who will buy the deal. So we're not worried about the end buyer. The end buyer is easy to find once you have a deal. Cool, we got a lot of Vegas people. Shout out to all you guys, Chris, Dolores, Terry, Natalie. Um, so just shout out to all of you guys. Um, we got a Reno person, very cool. Now. At the end of the day, you're just trying to get to an end buyer because guess what? The end buyer is going to fund the deal. They're going to bring the money. They're going to fix it up and renovate it. And then they're going to list it and flip. Okay. Now, the end buyer is going to have, you know, from the moment they buy it to the moment that, you know, they actually flip it and make money. Uh, let's just say it might take about four months. Okay. In many cases. So, you know, they got to wait four months. Whereas the wholesaler, you know, when they sell it to the end buyer, I mean, they might get paid in 14 days, you know, like our wholesale deals close pretty quick. So, you know, basically the, the risk versus reward that you run is, do you want to make in, in this scenario, let's just say 20 K in 14 days, or do you want to maybe make, you know, call it 45 K in four months, right? There's no right or wrong answer, guys, all right? It all just depends on your business. If you're just getting started, okay, and you got the opportunity to go make 20K right now, I'm taking it, all right? I'm not getting greedy and saying, oh, I got to, you know, go, like, I'm going to wait it out and do, like, for me, I'm taking 20K, and then I'm finding another deal, okay? And then, you know, I, I get that many of you want to get experience and flip and everything else. That's amazing. I, you're going to do it regardless, okay? This is what I always tell our students. You're going to end up buying rentals at some point, okay? It just doesn't have to be today, right? You need to make the best decision for today that gives you the best chance of having the best future, okay? That's why it's called the Flip Your Future Challenge, all right? I want you guys to have a better future, and that involves making great decisions today. So don't think that you need to get to the end goal the moment you start, okay? Are you guys getting fired up, by the way? Like, I, I feel fired up telling you guys this because nobody else says this. Everybody else on YouTube and, you know, all these other platforms, they're like, oh, get all your rentals right away, you know? Don't do any of this. You know, flipping's risky. You know, nobody's gonna wholesale. You know, just buy one rental at a time. It's like, no, okay? Go get deals. There are buyers out there. You can go make money right now, okay? And for me, right, a lot of people get so attached to one property. It's like, bro, I'm gonna be buying real estate literally until the day I die, okay? This is not the best property I'm ever gonna buy, okay? This is probably not gonna be the last house I ever live in, okay? Very few people have bought their forever home, okay? How many people, I don't know if any of you in here have done it. Put a one in the chat if you have. Have you ever bought your forever home and then sold it? You thought it would be your forever home. You know, you were so hyped about it. You're like, I'm going to live here for the next, you know, 10 years, 20 years. Like, this is going to be great. And then, you know, life 
life happens, right? <laughs> you either the house isn't that great anymore. You know, you're, you're leveling up, which would be great. And you're like, nah, dude, like I got bigger ambitions now, you know, or maybe you lost it at some point. Like, I don't know. Right. But very few people end up truly like buying a forever home. All right. So at the end of the day, um, I'm always going to take money in hand. Um, even in this scenario right now, like I would still look at both of these in my current business and just judge where my business is at. So if I've already got a ton of fix and flips and my contractors are busy and you know we're tight on capital, I might just say, let's wholesale. Let's just be done with it in wholesale, okay? And you know there might be a time where, hey, my contractors need work and we've got a lot of capital that needs to be deployed and so we'll flip it, right? There's no, in, in this scenario, for me anyways, I would be looking at it both ways. Um, now, if it became like this very obvious choice, let's just say, you know, you might make 10K on the wholesale and over here on the flip, you're going to make 80K. Well, in that case, you know, I'm going to take the flip, right? Because now it's like, man, dude, this is like a way, you know, better thing. So, you know, the, the, the question of should you flip or should you wholesale isn't like cut and dry. And this is what I want to tell you guys that's different about wealthy investors as well, is that we don't have a one size fits all, okay? I understand all of you are unique. You're unique in your circumstance, you know, how many kids you have, your spouse, your, your family. You're unique in the market that you're in. You're unique in your financial position and how much money you have. You're unique in your skill sets and, you know, your background. Maybe you're really good at sales. Maybe you're good at tech. Maybe you're good at, you know, the detail stuff. Everyone is unique. And for me, I'm not going to just tell everyone to do the same thing or do what I did because I'm unique in my own way and I'm going to do what works for me, but that may not necessarily work for you. So for us at Wealthy Investor, we really look at our students and we say, hey, this is what we think you should do based on your skill set and your situation. Okay. We're not going to say, hey, you need to only flip houses. Hey, we only do wholesaling over here. Hey, you got to only buy rentals. Like we don't do that. Okay. We want to work with you and help you figure out what's best. Okay. If, if that doesn't fire you up, I don't know what does. Put a two in the chat if it fires you up. Like for us, you're not a one size fits all, nor am I. Okay. So we got to do what's best for you. Okay. Point blank. Now, wholesaling is great. Um, obviously, uh, we could we could do that. And that's that's another exit strategy. But let's talk about the rental strategy. Okay. Rentals are amazing. I mean, this is how you build long-term wealth. Um, give you an example of rentals and, and why they're great. Um, you know, I, I've bought multiple rentals. Like, uh, actually, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. So I bought a house back in 2019. Um, it was a six, or no, I bought it for $525,000, which at the time was like, you know, that luxury in Las Vegas. You know, this is in a luxury community. And you know, I put about 125 grand into it. And so I was all in for like 650 um, with price and construction. And then, you know, I was trying to sell it for 800, couldn't sell it. You know, I was getting offers at like 700,000, which was basically breaking even after all the fees and money costs and all this stuff. Right. And I was like, you know what? I'm not selling it. This house is great. I'm just going to keep it as a rental. It's going to cash flow. And I know it's going to appreciate because it's in a great neighborhood. Well, Fast forward um, till today, really, uh, we have that property now listed for 1.2 million. And so <laughs> by keeping that property, I'm going to make 500 grand on it. Okay. So, you know, keeping rentals definitely has upside. You know, give you another example. You know, I just recently moved. I was telling you guys that. And if you follow my YouTube channel, um, we just recently did a home tour of our new house that I'm super excited about. But, you know, our old house, we're coming up on owning it for five years. So I lived there for, you know, about a little over four years. And then, you know, we moved into this new house and, you know, that house, I bought it for $570,000 after you factor in my commission credits and everything. Okay. And it's funny, like that that's low for where prices are today. I mean, this was a 3000 square foot, single story home, brand new construction, half acre lot, you know, in a prime area of Las Vegas. So if any of you guys, Aaron Vegas, you know, it was a killer deal. So, you know, I ended up putting about $150,000 into it. Um, you know, I redid the entire backyard. A, a, a bunch of that was in the backyard. And then, you know, we did some stuff on the inside. And so, you know, 
I was all into it for say 700,000 ish. Okay. Um, that house today, you know, I, I refinanced it and, and got some cash out um, a couple of years ago when rates were low, but my listing agent called me two days ago and he said, Ryan, you interested in selling your old house? I was like, I mean, it's rented right now. The, the rent is $7,000 a month. My mortgage is 4,500, you know, so I'm cash flowing a lot of money on that home and I got a low interest rate and everything. And he goes, well, you know, the market's hot and there's nothing for sale. Like in that neighborhood, um, they like, somebody's offering you 1.4 million cash. And I was like, I mean, I don't know that it's worth 1.4, maybe it's worth one, three, you know, but if, if they want to pay me cash and, you know, pay a hundred thousand more or $200,000 more. Like I told him, I go, I don't even want to sell it because the cash flow is so good, but tell them 1.5. I mean, if they want it that bad, let's see what they'll really pay. Right. And, you know, I don't have an intention of selling it, but if I do, I mean, let's just sell it. Say I sell it for the 1.5, you know, and I'm in it for one or I'm in it for 700,000. I mean, as a $700,000 profit, right. From just holding this property, um, you know, for the long haul. So more of that story is keeping rental properties is very beneficial. You know, it's not going to make you money today. Okay. Let's be very clear. Rentals are not going to really retire you. Like that's, that's a false myth that people promote, um, to sell courses. I mean, I'm, not, I'm just telling you guys, I'd love to sell you guys courses and education, but in all of my stuff, you're never going to hear me talk about, man, you know, buy this many properties and you're going to retire, right? You're never going to even hear me talk about retiring. I don't even want to retire. I like to work. I love doing stuff like this and helping people. Okay. So, you know, for us, you got to understand rentals aren't about the active income today. They're about the value tomorrow. All right. So, you know, in just five years, okay, I bought, you know, I've been investing in Airbnbs in Big Bear, California for, you know, I bought them all. I bought about 10 of them call it between three to five years ago. I haven't bought, um, you know, a couple in the last couple of years, but you know, these homes I bought, they have appreciated over $2 million worth in value. Okay. So for me, I have become a multimillionaire just from like kind of my side hustle five years ago. Like, obviously I've got all these other businesses and things I do, but I just decided to buy these Airbnbs and Big Bear five years ago. Um, because I got good at finding deals and I got good at raising money. I used none of my own money to go buy those deals in Big Bear. I then put them on Airbnb before Airbnb was even cool. Like I was on Airbnb back in 2017. Okay. People weren't doing it. There wasn't all these coaching programs on it. Like I've been doing it for a minute. And, you know, with those properties alone, I mean, we've made millions on Airbnb and just renting them out in income. And then they've appreciated over $2 million. Okay. So, you know, I'm just giving you examples of like, I, I believe in rental properties. <laughs> we manage over 550 of them. You know, I've got a fund where we go buy big apartment buildings with investors. You know, I've got my own portfolio of those Airbnbs. I've got my own portfolio of single families in Vegas, like we're talking about. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, by no means am I against rentals. I think they're amazing for long-term wealth, but they need to come at the right time. Okay. So for those of you who are trying to quit your jobs, a rental's not really for you right now. You need to flip and wholesale. That's how you're going to get out, okay? Now, if you're good with your job, like I was talking earlier, then buy a rental. Like, cool. You know, you're, you're, you're where you want to be. Build, buy rentals, you know, build equity, and just keep growing. That's great strategy because guess what? Five years from now, it's going to be worth more. 10 years from now, it's going to be worth even more. 30 years from now, if you were to keep it, I mean, it's going to triple at least. Like, there's no doubt about it. Look at where prices were 30 years ago. All right. I mean, it might 5X 30 years from now. So I'm a big fan of rentals. Um, you just have to understand the benefits of it, right? Appreciation is, you know, the main one. Um, you know, tax savings is probably the next one, right? It's like, People don't know this. I'm not going to get into it full, like super fully. Cause I just, man, I, I would love to chat here all day, but we, we only have so much time, but you know, you get tax deductions, you get all of this amazing stuff. Um, you get pay down, right? Your tenant is paying down your mortgage for you, you know, and you know, then you get cash flow. Cash flow is what people talk about the most, 
It's actually like the least important factor when people buy real estate. Okay. At the end of the day, um, most rich people are buying it for tax savings. You know, when you hear about guys like Donald Trump and everything else, and you're like, how does Donald Trump pay no taxes? I don't get it. It's because he owns rental properties. Okay. Now he owns big commercial buildings. He owns other stuff. But at the end of the day, that's how he pays no taxes. Right. And then he built his wealth because all those things appreciate it, right? The cash flow, you know, he's making cash flow, but that is insignificant compared to these other things. And, you know, when he keeps paying down that principle, he's going to make a ton. So how many, how, many of, how many of you, this is news to you, you know, you thought cash flow was like the most important thing with rentals, but now you're like, wow, okay, I guess it's not the most important thing. Appreciation's the most important thing. Right? Like, put a one in the chat if this is like news to you. Nobody's ever told you this because a lot of people don't realize this. I mean, think about it, right? Just using, um, for example, that property I bought that um, I was going to flip, and then all of a sudden um, I kept it as a rental. You know, in the last three years, maybe it's made, you know, I don't know, let's just call it $10,000 of cash flow, which would be pretty good, right? But it's appreciated 500K. I mean, you tell me, which one's more important? Is it cash flow or is it buying good deals that are going to appreciate? Okay. For me, I'm looking at buying great properties that I think are going to appreciate so I can have big wins down the road. All right. So these are the exit strategies to flip. All right. And this is how you build wealth. Okay. You build wealth from exactly what we've taught this three-day challenge. You find great deals, okay? You fund those deals and raise capital, and then you flip those deals. You figure out how you wanna exit, okay? And even with the rentals, you know, we didn't get into this, but if you find really good deals, that allows you to utilize the Burr strategy, okay? Are you guys familiar with the Burr strategy? Who's familiar with it? I, I wanna make sure I don't miss this point, but, you know, the Burr strategy is this, buy, renovate, okay, rent, refi, repeat, okay? My good buddy, I think Brandon Turner coined this from Bigger Pockets, and by the way, he's speaking at WealthCon, okay, in July. He's one of our keynotes, my good friend. Um, so, you know, basically, if you buy it, cheap enough, which is what we talk about here on finding good deals. And then you renovate it, which is what we talk about here on the flip side. You got to get it renovated. Then you rent it, which is what we talk about on the flip side. Okay. You decide to just go rent it out instead of selling it. Um, now you got to just refinance and there's lots of different lenders out there that will refinance. Um, you don't have to go to Wells and we give you uh, a bunch of lenders in the program. And then once you get the money back, you just repeat it, go find another deal and just keep repeating the process. That's how you make, um, you know, generational wealth. That's what I did in Big Bear, right? Like I found one deal, fixed it up, got it rented, refinanced it, and found another deal, fixed it up, <laughs> rented it out, refinanced it. You know, it's like you just do it over and over again. And that's all I've been doing, okay? Um, in fact, my current home, I was telling you guys about it on day one. You know, I bought it for 1.8 million. And out of that 1.8 million, I actually paid 200K to a wholesaler. <laughs> Isn't that crazy, guys? This wholesaler made 200K off of me for selling me the home. It's pretty nuts. Um, I then put $1.2 million of renovation into it. And so, you know, I was all in for three, give or take. And then I got an appraisal for $3.9 million. So, you know, I basically created 900K of equity by buying this one deal. So basically, this one deal made me a millionaire. Like, it, that's what, how you want to look at it. It basically made me a millionaire. And I was able to get a loan for three million bucks, basically all I was all in for. So I own my house and I designed it specific to what I wanted for no money into the deal because I did a burr. All right. That's the power of real estate, guys. That's the power that happens when you learn to find good deals. And you learn to use other people's money to buy those deals. And you understand how to do construction and exits and everything else. Okay. So tell me this. Okay. 
If you could learn to do all those things, like if I gave you everything I knew and people that were trained by me were able to help you do what I do, how much would it be worth to you? Okay. Like what would the cost be to learn that skill? You know, how much would you pay on the open market to learn that skill? It'd be pretty valuable if you could learn skills that made you a million dollars in one deal or even $25,000 in one deal or $100,000 in one deal, right? It's a valuable skill to have. And at Wealthy Investor, we can teach you those skills, all right? We can teach you those skills and you can be buying deals. So that concludes our three-day Flip Your Future Challenge. I'm sure you've learned a ton throughout this video and kudos to you for making it all the way through. This is not the end of your journey. It's actually just the beginning. You now have the framework to go out and flip houses. But as I've been saying throughout the video, there's obviously a lot more that goes into it. You know, having the foundation is amazing, but taking action with that foundation is what matters. And the way that you can take action and get through the problems is by having a community around you, by having a coach, by having the right systems and processes, and just being around other people that are making it happen too. So if you wanna flip your future and change your life, we wanna help you out at Wealthy Investor. It's really simple. All you gotta do is go book a call with our team at wealthyinvestor.com. We would love to be standing next to you, going side by side and helping you get that first deal or even scale your real estate business. So make sure you click the link below, book a call with our team, and I'll see you on our next call.